you guys should all see that now. So it is being recorded. There was quite a few people who had asked if, if they could get a transcript of this meeting. So that is one of the reasons why we're recording it. Um, if you would like copies of the presentations, because we don't have an outward facing um, website for this annual meeting, uh, all the presenters have their email addresses in the agenda. So if you want a copy of the presentation, I ask that you just email the presenters themselves and ask them for a copy of the presentation. We're going to try to stay as close as possible to the schedule. So Rod, who will introduce himself in a few seconds, is going to uh, make sure that we all stay on schedule according to the agenda, because there is going to be some people who are jumping in and out just for specific presentations. And we don't want to we don't want to mess that up for him. Um, and then so let so each each presentation has 20 minutes um, and we will give you 15 minutes for the presentation. And then if you go a little bit longer, you know, we'll let you know when you're at your 15 minutes. Feel free to go a little bit longer to wrap up, but it's a total of 20 minutes. So if you go 15 minutes, you have five minutes for questions, which is great. Um, if you have a question, go ahead and do the virtual hand raise. Does everybody know where the virtual you guys should be old hats at this by now? But if you go up to the top, you'll see um, you'll see like smiley face and hands. There's like a, a raise your hand, so you can raise your hand there, or feel free to type it in the chat, and we'll be monitoring the chat. If you don't have ability to talk or you don't want to talk, you can also put it in the chat. And if you want to ask a question, we'll call on you, and you can either turn your mic on, and then um, and you can turn your camera on too if you like as well. It's kind of nice to see faces. Um, also, one thing I've noticed is that our email list could use a little bit updating. So if you were on this meeting and you weren't part of the original invitation or the original Outlook invite and you want to get one next year, please send me your email address. You can just um, either send me a personal chat in Teams or just email me. I put my email in the chat and then I'll add your email list. I had a, quite a few people send me their email and I do appreciate that. And or if you know people who you think should be added to it and weren't added, go ahead and also put that in the chat. OK, so I am Melissa Shar, and I'm your co-host for this Clark Fork Basin annual meeting. I have been with um, the USGS Water Wyoming Montana Water Science Center as the groundwater and water quality studies chief for only a few months now, but I have been in Montana for quite some time. A lot of you remember me from AWRA. I was part of AWA for quite a bit. I was also with the Montana DNRC as a supervisory hydrologist and then also with the Montana DEQ as a water quality standards specialist. I also worked in private um, industry as a hydrogeologist for many years. I'm really excited to be part of the USGS, USGS's continual efforts on the Clark Fork Basin. And I am joined by my co my cohorts, Rod Codwell and Greg Clark, who also are part of the efforts. And first, I'm going to let Rod introduce himself. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Rod Caldwell. I'm a hydrologist with the USGS uh, here in Helena at our Water Science Center. I've been with the survey for, I guess I'm in my 32nd year. Uh, started in Oregon for the first third, and since then I've been in Montana. Worked on a lot of hydrologic assessments throughout the western United States, water quality, surface water, groundwater surface water, uh, water use. I have dabbled a bit with the Clark Fork project uh, through time. Uh, actually, I was hanging from a cableway on March 28th, 2008, when the Milltown Dam was breached, and got to watch the water level rise and collect samples as uh, the, some of the sediment went downstream, uh, higher turbidities later in the day. So currently I'm back involved with the Clark Fork project, transitioning from Greg Clark. I'm really excited to do so. Uh, got to sample last week, got to fall in Warm Springs Creek, got to get wet and had a miserable day, but hopefully that's not the shape of things to come. But I'm really excited to hear the talks today and again, I will be the timekeeper and I will bug you maybe with about five minutes left in your time slot. And uh, I'm looking forward to the talks. Thank you. All right, great. 
Thanks, Rod. And for those of you who have just recently tuned in, if you are not talking, we just ask that you turn your, your cameras off because it does take up um, some of the, the bandwidth for those who uh, don't have as, you know, have great internet. Um, so next we'll hear from Greg and he's going to give just a brief overview of USGS's efforts in the Clark Park Basin. Uh, hi, I'm Greg Clark. Uh, I started with the Wyoming Montana Water Science Center in 2019, uh, primarily working on the management and implementation of the Clark Fork long-term monitoring project. Um, but as Rod said, this will be transitioning over to Rod and Melissa as I uh, get more involved with some other work. But I plan to still be um, a part of the Clark Fork uh, studying, uh, or at least I plan to continue my involvement with the Clark Fork Long-Term Monitoring Project. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, the USGS has been collecting water quality in the basin since 1985. And I think it was in 1993, it developed into the Long-Term Monitoring Project in cooperation with the EPA. Each year we submit, or we produce a, an open file report detailing the water quality uh, from the basin uh, at about 22 sites. Um, it looks like Melissa put the most recent report in the chat if you wanted to check that out. Um, starting next year, we're going to be adding real time temperature, specific conductance, and uh, turbidity to four sites on the main stem between Galen and Missoula. Um, that's it. Thank you. Wonderful. Look at that, we're still on schedule. I love it. OK. All right, so next we're going to hear. Um, I just saw that Maury got online. We're going to hear from the Upper Clark Fork Working Group. Um, that is correct. OK, all right. But I won't be speaking. But yes, Doug is going to be th speaking on Doug your behalf. Be yeah. All right. Well, well, thank you, Melissa, and thank you to the USGS for um, sponsoring this uh, annual meeting again. Uh, very nice uh, collection of talks that you have lined out, and we appreciate that. The the Upper Clark Fork Working Group um, actually got initiated and spawned from some of these uh, annual meetings that the USGS has has worked on over the the years. What and what we would just like folks to know, and I, I do notice that. It, a lot of the people that are on this call um, regularly participate in the Upper Clark Fork uh, Working Group. What, um, and I'm not sure if I can share my screen or not. Will I be allowed to, Melissa? Yep, everybody should be able to share their screen. Okay, all right. So um, if you can see the, the screen here, I believe it says the Upper Clark Fork Working Group. Um, we're just a group of uh, people working in the in the basin to try to integrate information, ideas, and actions, and, and uh, spread that out amongst the professionals and others working in the group, <clears throat> or working in the basin, excuse me. Um, we do have a website that is uh, currently sponsored and, and updated by the university. And on that website, there are there's a calendar of, uh, of events that we have. There's a strategic plan that's been put together of, of what we what the mission of this working group is. Um, there's also a, a list of the meetings that we have held, and there's recordings of all those meetings on this website, as well as uh, updates from the workshops. Um, the, the website also hosts a, a interact, interactive map of the Upper Clark Fork that lists all of the projects that we know of and that people have submitted to us to put on there. And the biggest um, focus that, that we are looking for this working group to do is, is much like what this annual meeting does, is present information to those interested and those working in the basin and provide that as a conduit for those people to interact if you have questions with those folks. So that uh, if you do have a question about what somebody else is, is um, doing or what kind of data they're collecting, you can actually go to that person or go to a group or uh, find out how to get that information. 
Um, as some of you have known, um, trying to set up a database of all of the data that's been collected in the upper Clark Fork is next to impossible. Um, it's been tried several times. Uh, Atlantic Richfield's tried it, uh, the Bureau of Mines tried it, DEQ's tried it, DPA's tried it. Um, it's just something that's not a very feasible thing to put together all the data. So what we're trying to do with this working group is, you know, build off of a lot of, as I said, what the USGS has done here is, you know, bringing people together and talking about what they're doing. Um, what the working group is doing is trying to continue that throughout the year. Um, we have regularly scheduled meetings it's they're typically the second thursday of every month at noon um you can go if you're interested in joining this uh working group and listening in on those um sessions and the second thursday at noon uh, you can go to the website and uh, enter your information and you'll automatically get an email giving you the the zoom uh, invite to those meetings um we have a wide variety of, of topics that we talk about. Um, and next, uh, I will note that next uh, next uh, month in November, um, the second Thursday is actually a, a state and federal holiday. Um, so we've actually moved it to the uh, November 18th. So, but once again, I'd like to encourage everybody to, you know, uh, participate in these meetings. We've actually had uh, some very good turnout. Um, and people working uh, with us and in developing this group and we're I know Maury and I are excited about it. So if anybody has any questions, um, I would be happy to uh, take any questions about the working group at this time or if Maury, if you have any more to add, please do so. I think Doug covered it pretty well. I would emphasize that the working group is trying to integrate personnel and perspectives and November's a uh, presentation on the 18th, as Doug indicated, will in fact be a USGS representative, Travis Schmidt. So if you're interested, please go to the um, website. There's an opportunity to sign up there and you'll end up on the email list and get the communications. We hope that as many of you are interested will in fact do so. And thanks to Doug for the presentation. So we're five minutes ahead now, Melissa, so I'm not sure what you're gonna do with that five minutes. I know I was going to do a little <laughs> tap dance or something like that. I was thinking, but um, one thing I just wanted to say was that I did notice that you guys do put your um, your your talks on YouTube and you can access them later, which was great because I actually wasn't around to see your last talk with Arco and I was able to actually watch that after the fact. So if, if you can't see Travis's, um, well, he's going to be talking during this meeting as well, but if you don't see Travis's presentation, it looks like you guys do send out an email with the presentation after the fact. So that's much appreciated. Yeah, that is correct, Melissa. And actually the, the presentations are, you can get to those off our website too. So you can even go back and look at ones that we gave last April or May as well, so. Wonderful, wonderful. I was that third person that watched it on YouTube. Oh, nice. Um, I don't, I can't guarantee anything. Um, well, I won't say it, I'll, I'll, I'll look into it first. I was gonna offer to put these presentations on this website, but I'm not gonna offer that until I get clearance from the webmaster first. Oh, oh, yeah, that would actually be super helpful considering we don't have uh, the ability to host, so. That, that webmaster is on the group chat right now, or is watching right now. Uh -oh, I, just, I, just, I just signed on. Hi, I'm Andrew Hauer. I am more than happy to uh, put the, this talk on, on our YouTube channel, and um, we'll just connect later, Melissa, and get that set up. Wonderful, that is great news. I'll, I'll write that in my notes. Um, so one thing just just to go over, we have a couple more minutes before we start the presentations. Just wanted to go over uh, for those of you who have joined late. Please um, just keep yourself muted as well as keep your uh, cameras off if you're not presenting because it does take up a little bit of bandwidth. Um, we will be doing 20 minute presentations, 15 minutes for the actual presentation, five minutes for questions. 
We will be trying to stick to schedule pretty closely because there are members who will want to tune in and tune out. So it's I, I know it's very frustrating and I got into some serious trouble when I was in the AWRA and I bumped up a presentation. So believe me, I heard about that. So we won't do that. We'll try to stay as, as much to schedule as possible. And if you have questions at the end of the, just raise your hand, raise your virtual hand. Uh, if you don't know how to do that, it's at the top and you have all the, you have a little smiley face and you have the little hand. Um, if you do the applause, we'll know what you mean. That means you raise your hand, just means you do the applause. But, um, and then Greg, I do believe Greg will be calling on you to, in the order that you actually raise your hand. Hopefully that works. <laughs> And then um, we will also, um, you can also type your question. So if you want to ask a question and you don't want to, you, you know, turn your camera on and ask the question, you don't have to turn your camera on if you don't want to, but um, if you want to turn your camera on and ask a question when you're called on, that's great. Or you can also just type it in the chat and then we'll read off that question. And we do apologize that if you don't have enough time, if um, because we are staying on schedule, if we don't have time for all the questions, the presenter can see the questions and perhaps they can then answer them in the chat or you can you can just get with the presenter later send them an email their emails addresses are in the agenda so you are more than welcome to um get that out of the agenda and email we did ask the presenters if it was okay for their email addresses to be in there no one said it wasn't so i'm assuming that's compliance <laughs> um and then and we'll move forward with that. And then it sounds like this is being it's being recorded and we it will be available to those who would like to see it on the Upper Clark Fork Working Group uh, web page, which is very exciting. Very excited about that. Um, all right, moving forward. We are going to start our presentations. We are going to start with Amanda Bailey and Megan Moore. Are you guys out there? We're here. OK, great. If you I'll start introducing you guys if you want to start getting your presentation loaded up. So Megan is a third year PhD student in the Department of Society and Conservation at the University of Montana, where she studies the intersection of memory, community resilience and transitions for post industrial rural communities. She received her master's in geography from Montana State. Yay, I'm a Bobcat, where she examined climate change adaptation strategies for landowners in Southwest Montana. Um, Amanda is a postdoc at UM working with Libby Metcalf as part of the Cruise Natural Resources Social Sciences team. She recently received her PhD in anthropology from UCLA and she lives in Missoula. All right, take it away. Awesome. Are you, is everyone seeing the correct slides and can hear me? Yep. Awesome. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Um, as Melissa said, my name is Megan and I'm a PhD student at the University of Montana. This research is funded by the Consortium for Research on Environmental Water Systems, or CRUES, which is part of an NSF EPSCoR grant. And I want to acknowledge that we are presenting in the Aboriginal territories of the Salish and Kalispell people today. We honor the path that they have always shown us in caring for this place for the generations to come. Amanda and I will be sharing the stage today. I will first discuss collective memory and a survey effort our team is about to release to communities in the Upper Clark Fork. And then I'll pass it on to Amanda who will discuss public engagement. As post-industrial communities face changes, such as economic transitions or environmental cleanup projects, there are local perspectives, emotional attachments, and values to consider. As communities look to transition, there are both spatial and temporal scales that assist or hinder these efforts. For post-industrial communities like Anaconda, broader scales such as state and federal governments, along with industries and companies, impact their economies, Superfund regulations, and other trends. Individuals can also pull communities in certain directions. Time plays an important role in these communities, both in the current context where amenity migration and telework are on the rise throughout the US West, especially in the past year or so. And the past also affects both the present and the future, which may be best understood through the lens of memory. Collective memory is where social identity and historical memory intersect. It's how individuals as parts of groups or communities remember and share experiences and information through traditions and public symbols. 
Collective memory emerged from interviews we conducted last summer in Anaconda and Deer Lodge, where we asked questions about community identity, history, the Superfund process, and the future. For Anaconda specifically, many interviewees were interested in talking about their heritage and their mining legacy. Many saw hope in this future path forward and wanted to see a strong sense of community, a solid tax base, and good jobs. And this led us to consider that community, community desires and moving forward and reimagining their towns are so much more than just revolving around environmental or contamination issues. The stack emerged as an anchor to the past for Anaconda in that the community kept reminiscing about what it represented and was formerly capable of, which could impact both economic and cultural change. And there were five themes that related to the stack as an anchor that stood out to us. People that were holding on to hope, um, the stack as a reminder of better times, a connection to history, culture, and family, the stack as a life source, and also as a source of contamination or loss. For example, many older interviewees held out hope that the stack would resume operations after it was closed in 1980. As one interviewee said, it's taken decades for some of those old timers to realize that the smelter reopening is not going to happen. The stack reminded the community of better times. These better times were often classified economically in terms of the smelter operation providing an economy and jobs for the town and for the overall importance of Anaconda on the national stage. One interviewee commented, I think the way that I grew up, if there was smoke coming out of the stack, it represented prosperity. The stack reflected the importance of copper and by association Anaconda for advancing electrical and military needs for the US. One interviewee spoke of the inherent connection between copper and the stack, saying, when you think about the copper that came out of Butte and Anaconda, that copper basically served to electrify much of the eastern US. Based on our interviews, it was clear that we needed to further examine the role that collective memory plays in Anaconda and Deer Lodge for these communities and how they view themselves now and into the future and how that might fit into the larger cleanup efforts and economic development. We also wanted to better understand these relationships from a larger sample size, and we're getting ready to release a survey to these communities in the coming weeks. This survey will be sent out to both communities and households will be randomly selected, and each household will be sent a pre-letter, the survey, a reminder letter, and then another survey that's sent out over, over the course of a few weeks. We have collective memory questions that we'll be asking where we ask community members to list the three most important events in the history of their community and for them to also list the most important places in their communities. We also ask them if they live in Anaconda about their feelings on the stack, questions such as we are proud to have the stack, the stack is part of my identity, and for people that live in Deer Lodge, questions about the river such as the community is attached to the river, the river is really important to my community. And we're also interested in looking to connect collective memory with this community outlook and their desired economic development. So we have community outlook questions such as this community gives me plenty of resources and planning for the future. I do not feel limited by the options that are available here. Overall, this community is headed in the right direction and I feel hopeful about my community's prospects for the future. And these economic development questions came out of the interviews where a lot of interviewees talked about how they envisioned the future and what their town might look like. And that included people talking about wanting a tourism town that was based on outdoor recreation, maybe a town that has a thriving main street where they're able to go into stores and purchase things without having to go online or to bigger cities a town with infrastructure that supports remote workers, or perhaps another industrial hub, such as a manufacturing center. And we developed these collective memory questions um, ourselves. This is the first time that there are quantitative measures to understand collective memory. So we're really excited to see um, how these memory uh, measures impact outlook and economic development and to see if really in this larger community and across these communities, memory is something that is holding communities back or if it could perhaps be harnessed um, towards these future objectives. So we really look forward to sharing these results when we have them. And now I'm going to pass it on to Amanda to talk about public engagement. 
Hi everyone, can you hear me okay? Yep, yes. you sound great. All right, great. Okay, so um, hello, my name is Amanda Bailey. Um, I'm now gonna step in for the second part of our presentation to touch on another way that time has emerged as relevant in findings from our research in Anaconda, um, as well as the nearby community of Deer Lodge. So today I'm gonna be discussing the role of time on public engagement among community members in the Superfund cleanup process. So what I'm discussing today is based on findings from interviews we conducted with community leaders in Deer Lodge and Anaconda during the summer of 2020. In Anaconda, we conducted 33 interviews and in uh, Deer Lodge, we did 22. And we coded the interviews using the qualitative coding program um, in vivo in order to identify, analyze, and connect themes. So as most of you know, these two communities, um, which are both uh, part of the Superfund cleanup effort, have been impacted by the legacy of mining in the region in different ways. In Anaconda, as Megan discussed, the cleanup is currently focused on the high degree of contamination uh, from the smelter stack that now reaches into the intimate spaces of attics, yards, and home vegetable gardens. And then 25 miles away in the smaller community of Deer Lodge, the focus of the cleanup efforts are on a 43 mile stretch of the Clark Fork River, which longtime residents can remember as formerly running red. So part of the Superfund cleanup effort for the area includes two mandated public comment periods. The first happens after a site is listed for consideration on the national priorities list and the second occurs anytime there are changes to the record of decision. So for the towns I'm discussing today, in addition to these two mandated comment periods, there have been many additional opportunities for community members to participate in public meetings arranged by local government, local organizations, universities, and nonprofits. Public engagement in these meetings is central to people's participation in the cleanup of their own communities. Additionally, public engagement, as Laura et al. point out, is well established as an effective and necessary means for improving social ecological systems or SES management and offers a promising means for increasing satisfaction and acceptance of SES management efforts. Additionally, an examination into public engagement can provide insights into the concept of community resilience, which Norris et al. describe as how a network of adaptive capacities inform adaptation after a disturbance or adversity. So in this model, public engagement might fall under the social capital adaptive capacity through the subcategories of citizen participation and social embeddedness, and under the adaptive capacity of community competence, public engagement connects with the subcategories of community action and even political partnerships. And while generally disasters are associated with an acute event, such as a wildfire, these authors open up their definition by including chronic environmental issues produced by things such as a Superfund site. So for Deer Lodge and Anaconda, the legacy of contamination and cleanup is in some ways time bound in terms of a point in time in which they received the Superfund designation as well as an eventual, if unclear, end to the funding and cleanup process. But the 100-year legacy of the mining contamination is also so profound that there's no clear endpoint to the harm it may continue to cause. So in this way, it's almost a disaster without end. And this uncertain timeline is one of the reasons that came up for what we found reported across both Anaconda and Deer Lodge as a general lack of public engagement in the Superfund process. So in addition to the other factors listed here, time emerged as a theme for why engagement was described as often being limited to a small core group of people. One participant noted the vast timeline for recovery saying, 
Looking at it from water quality issues, we're talking about 25,000, 30,000 years. Probably won't live long enough to see some of these groundwater things cleaned up. But people also described how the 40 year Superfund timeline can seem to drag without apparent progress. Uh, someone said, it seemed like the cleanup just lagged and lagged and lagged. So in other words, you knew it was a Superfund site. You knew they were supposed to be doing something, but what are they doing? Where is it? And echoing what Megan described in terms of the power of a visible presence, another participant described how interest was related to what could be presently and clearly observed, saying, I have found it's waxed and waned. When the golf course was happening, then interest was high. And then that died down. Say the Warm Springs Pond, oop, here, ears perk up again. It's kind of like these more visible big things that happen. Or why are all those trucks crossing the highway constantly and they're filled with dirt? And where are they going with that dirt? It's kind of like, unless it's right in front of our faces, we don't pay attention. But it's also important to mention another finding that emerged in our analysis of the interviews. So in addition to asking questions related to Superfund, we also address community dynamics more broadly. We asked things like, what are people most proud of in your community? And what brings people together in Deer Lodge or Anaconda? And through these questions, we were able to learn that while these communities tended to not be publicly engaged in the Superfund process, these were otherwise highly engaged communities. So in both places, especially Deer Lodge, civic engagement and volunteerism was reported as extremely high. And in Anaconda, people often lauded people's abilities to rally around a community member or a beloved cause or landmark. And so while we're still analyzing our findings so far and expanding what we know through the upcoming community survey, this does open up possibilities for how we can use information on where, how, and why people come together and rally to inform how Superfund information is framed and shared. And thanks for listening. We're open to questions. Well done. First of all, you're right on time to the second. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Oh. Yeah, this is Doug Martin. I raised my hand. Go for it, Doug. Um, I, I would act, uh, actually ask uh, both of you, you, you talk about community engagement and, and, and public meetings and that type of thing. Um, I know that the Natural Resource Damage Program has held um, probably over 100 public meetings since, you know, 2000, the year 2000. Um, what was, did, did, were you guys asking about certain types of public meeting or were you just trying to get input on whether or not people were engaged, you know, just um, without being prompted? Thanks for that question. Um, in our original questions, um, we, we asked about um, public meetings kind of more broadly. Um, and so we did get some information from that. Um, we also, you know, sort of as Megan described with the survey in terms of how we're taking findings from the interviews and finding out more through the survey, um, we're also asking about um, attendance in Superfund meetings, as well as um, perceptions of the Superfund process, as well as participation in other kinds of community events. Um, in terms of breaking it down into, you know, who uh, led the meetings, we didn't actually get to that detail. So that's an, you know, that's an interesting. Um, Point that you make and something that's definitely worth looking into more. Are, are your findings going to have any 
I guess, recommendations for for us as as public officials of how to better engage with with the community? Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't have it handy, but um, if you'd be interested, I can share some of the questions we're asking about just the perceptions of Superfund, the Superfund process in general, and sort of in some of the questions revolve around things like um, whether they had a, enough advance notice, um, you know, just kind of whether they felt it, it was relevant or addressed their needs, whether they felt like their voices were heard. Um, just based on some of these initial findings about the way these other ways that community members are very highly engaged, um, it suggests that there, there might be a way to sort of look at the intersection of community engagement and Superfund engagement, maybe in things like holding meetings, you know, in these places where people gather um, around issues that they see as very present to their everyday lives, somehow framing the, the Superfund information to fit into these other concerns that get people to rally. And we will be happy to share those recommendations um, with every anyone who's involved in the process and is interested. Okay, thank you. I'll be in touch. Yeah, great. Looks like Mari has a question. An interesting uh, presentation, you guys. Thanks for that. And I suspect if you had unlimited resources and time, you'd do all, all things. But one of the things we have observed in terms of the, the chemistry and the biota of the river is that it changes greatly from the headwaters near Anaconda, Warm Springs, and then as you move down Valley. The communities you guys have chosen, will they, will they reflect different locations on the river? Or maybe a better question is, what has guided the, the identity of the community you've chosen to address? Amanda, I'm ha I'm happy to take that one. Sure, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Because you were sort of the instigator and the, you know, driving force of of uh, yeah. creating this project. Yeah. Thank you both. Hi all, I'm Libby Metcalf. Um, yeah, Maury, uh, great question. We started actually with Milltown um, about six, eight years ago, and it was very clear when we started working in Milltown that feelings were much different upstream. Um, we also knew that we wanted to work in rural communities, and so we, and depending on how you define it in all these different ways, Anaconda and Deer Lodge really emerged. At one point, we looked at Drummond um, and some other smaller groups along the river, but um, we felt the, between Anaconda and Deer Lodge, and there's just kind of differences across the Superfund complex that they were going to be really interesting to compare across the three sites. And so some of you who know I've published a little bit on kind of the Milltown work and the successes there around engagement and trust. Um, we will have comparable measures on this next round of data collection. So it'll be really interesting to see how um, some of these ideas around engagement and trust differ across these rural communities. Very good. I think we, we better move on and I guess people can ask questions later as well. So thank you. Wonderful. Uh, Travis, if you want to get loaded up, I will uh, introduce you. All right, so next, our next speaker is Travis Schmidt. He is a research ecologist with the USGS Wyoming Montana Water Science Center with a research program focused on how aquatic ecosystems respond to contaminants. He is he has received his PhD from Colorado State University and a, a master's from Virginia Tech and a BS from Penn State. All right, take it away, Travis. Hi, all. I, uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, does this sound all right? Sounds great. Awesome. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for this opportunity to, uh, to join the conference today. Um, I am uh, fairly new to Montana. Uh, I'll put that right out front, but I've been studying abandoned mine lands and the effects of metal mixtures on ecosystems for many years. And today I wanted to take the opportunity to share with you some of my experiences using mesocosm experimentation to try to uh, address uh, question questions that are really germane to some of the issues that we're talking about here on the Clark Fork. Uh, taken from a recent uh, 
manuscript that my PhD advisor was lead on, but Michelle Hornberger and Terry Short, who've been heavily involved in the Clark Fork, were um, also important to this manuscript. And I think uh, McGuire Consulting was key to sharing some of this data. Um, in this manuscript, they 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 looked at the effect of mine line reclamation on aquatic invertebrate communities from four different major mining districts in the Western United States. And you can see uh, that uh, the timing of reclamation indicated by the arrow here. And you can see that in, in the cases of the Arkansas, Leavenworth, and, and possibly Big, Big Deer Creek, that there was a response of the invertebrate communities um, notable here. But the, if you're looking at the Clark Fork, it seems that the impacted site, which is the, the, the darker site here, um, seems to be tracking may, maybe positively, but but hasn't recovered to the to the unimpacted site. So question remains, you know, what what all this effort to reclaim the Clark Fork, yet the invertebrate community hasn't quite responded as as expected. And that elicits a number of of questions that I commonly deal with um, in these situations. Are the metal concentrations existing in these reclaimed ecosystems protective of aquatic invertebrate communities? That seems like kind of a no-brainer question, but I think for a number of reasons you'll see through this presentation, in, in many cases, we just don't never have developed the data to actually address that question. Um, if we don't know what's safe, then, you know, if they're not safe, then, then what could be the safe concentrations? Um, are metal mixtures causing unforeseen risks in here? Much of the risk assessment literature, ecotoxicological literature looking at metal mixture effects generally just make a cocktail of metals that match a river and then try to determine at, at what level of that cocktail do you see effects. And we learn very little about how changing metal concentrations and ratios of those mixtures actually cause changes in these ecos ecosystems. So it leaves us with a huge knowledge gap. Um, and of course, with the Clark Fork, I know that there's a, a interest in the possibility of nutrient enrichment as a co-stressor, as well as um, uh, maybe drought and climate change and flow limitations. And so hopefully today, um, I can show you some experiment data and, and results that that I've uh, curated over the past couple of years to kind of get at those questions. And it's, I need to make the point that it's really hard often to, 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 to really get at the heart of these, these types of questions using field data alone. And so often we turn to experimentation to try to understand like, well, okay, we remediated all the copper, but is the zinc, you know, low enough or, if we add some some nitrate in there, do we expect to see the same response? So we develop these really simplistic bioassay type approaches and we manipulate these things in the absence of other stressors to try to get a better understanding of a biological response that we then apply to an ecosystem. And for a number of reasons, that doesn't always work out so well. And that's because ecosystems aren't characterized by a monoculture of the same age, single organism in a beaker. And ecosystems are uh, a place where contaminants move through multiple routes of uh, uh, multiple right routes of exposure. You have dissolved concentrations, you have um, chemicals moving their way through the food web. And so bioassays aren't complicated enough to really represent an ecosystem. But in a mesocosm lab, we start working with communities and populations. So by moving our experimentation out of the bio uh, assay realm and into a mesocosm approach, we, we build that ecological complexity into our experimentation, but then we control for the covariates and confounding issues that you see in, in field data. Um, and that gives us a little bit more causal associations with, with our study conclusions. And this mix of complexity and causality results in data that can be directly applied to resource decisions in ecosystems. And I'll show you some of that today. Oops. So this is the Mesocosm Lab. Um, this is a, a photo of it um, in its most, uh, or in the, in the past in, in Colorado, we are wrapping up, rebuilding this here in Helena, Montana. 
and it consists of 36 different little streams that are all hydrologically plumbed as individual ecosystems. And so we take rock trays from the uh, a natural uh, from a stream they're naturally colonized by aqu aquatic invertebrates and we put them into these ecosystems where they go on about their lives as usual. And here you can see caddisflies and mayflies, and there's a black fly in there, and they're filtering this coarse organic matter and eating away on, on the algae. And so they're going about living their lives here. And so in this way, it seems um, pretty realistic representation of what's happening in the stream. Over a course of about four or five years, we developed a large number of experiments that we ran to try to better understand the effect of, of metals and metal mixtures on these communities. And one of the things that we were uh, concerned about was um, reproducibility. We were going to have to run these experiments in sequential years, and we were concerned that maybe we would see very different responses through time. But in fact, here you can see that we can get dose response curves for mayfly communities that are brought into the lab uh, on an annual basis with a high level of reproducibility and precision. And so this is just to demonstrate that, that um, these mesocosms can be pretty sharp tools. And one of the things that we uh, discovered was that aquatic insects historically have been thought of as rather insensitive to metals. Here you can see species sensitivity ranked. So the species on the far right are insensitive, and the farther you go to the left, they're more sensitive. Um, these dots being EC20s for exposure to copper. And so prior to our running these mesocosm experiments, you'll see that invertebrates, benthic macroinvertebrates, and insects populated the higher portion of this this uh, distribution, species sensitivity distribution, and the bottom end here was actually driven by Hyala Azteca, a cladostra, and, and white sturgeon in the case of, of copper. But then we ran some mesocosm experiments and we found, well, lo and behold, yeah, these endemic mayflies are super sensitive. So sensitive that they're almost, their EC20s are almost an order of magnitude lower than national aquatic life standards and international like this EU aquatic life standard for, for copper. And so what we learned here is that, you know, even if you clean up to uh, established environmental standards, aquatic insects, which are not very well represented in the Ecotox databases these standards are derived from, are actually more sensitive. And so you can clean up to these thresholds and maybe not get the recovery you expected. We also learned that metal mixtures are really interesting to study. That when, for example, here we have number of mayflies in the mesocosms and their sensitivity to zinc, but when you add in another metal or two, what we see is, yeah, it's more toxic. Who would have guessed that? You know, that's not the interesting thing here. What's interesting here is that at concentrations in this realm that I'm highlighting, these, these are concentration ranges where all of these metals are below effect concentrations. But when you mix them together, we're seeing lethality. And so that's an interesting phenomenon that the just increasing the complexity of the mixture at extremely low concentrations increases toxicity. We went one step further. We used the dose response curves that we developed for individual taxa um, and used that to predict the impact of the metal mixtures. In this way, we could, we could ask the question, are these risks due to metal mixtures the result of additive increases in risk? So you take the risk for cadmium and add that to the risk of zinc, much as we do with CCUs um, when, when assessing risk in ecosystems. And so we made this risk model, and if the risk model produces a prediction that falls on the white line, then it's in perfect agreement with what we observed. If the data points scatter above it, then it turns out the metal mixtures are more toxic than expected. And if they fall below the line, they are less toxic than expected. And after four years of experimentation, in general, we would tell you that in fact, metals in mixtures, as I showed you in the previous graph, just the presence of more metals is more toxic. However, it is not a linear increase 
uh, it's not a linearly additive increase. And so there are times when we can overestimate risks um, give, using our most common risk assessment approaches. Not only is metal mixtures a more complicated uh, environment um, than previously thought, um, in terms of lethality and effects on aquatic health. Um, but in terms of metal accumulation into a caddis fly, here we're showing copper uh, uh, concentrations in a caddis fly versus their exposure in the mesocosms. And what we see is that when you increase the complexity of the, of the mixture they're exposed to, that perhaps the metals are interacting and maybe competing for the same number of sites for accumulation. And so you might see less accumulation of copper, but that's not always the case. It seems that there's a really interesting interaction with maybe zinc. But then when we turn around and look at uh, the same, um, look at the opposite view of this of this ex experiment where we have just zinc in the in the water versus the accumulation in caddis fly. Again, we see with some mixtures we might see some subtle changes due to competition among the metal mixtures, but when you mix copper and zinc together or cadmium and copper and zinc together, we get these ecological surprises, which can't ex actually be explained with, with um, mechanisms known in the literature. So what did we learn? Aquatic insects are more sensitive than we originally thought. And so utilizing national standards for targets for reclamation may not get you to the end of the road that you were uh, expecting to achieve. Um, may not get, get you to the target that you wanted to get to. Metal mixtures are more toxic, except when they're not. So they're not all the same and our, our standard practices that are being implemented all over the world, adding risks um, due to metal mixtures are actually inappropriate. And we have a lot to learn there. As evidence from the way metal mixtures move through these food webs, they clearly move in ways that we don't totally understand and grasp. And so there can be unforeseen effects of these metal mixtures. And so I hope what you gleaned from some of this data I showed, shared with you today is that, you know, mesocosm experimentation can be really useful for filling some of these knowledge gaps that remain in the literature. And I hope that maybe some of these things that I shared with you might have some implication on perhaps why the chloric fork hasn't recovered as anticipated. I'm not real familiar with all of the issues in the chloric fork, but I think some of these might play directly into um, some of the uh, issues with the recovery of the invertebrate communities. I also wanted to plug the fact that we have utilized this, this rich database that we've amassed through a series of metal mixture experimentation and developed a predictive tool that now can be implemented in unique ecosystems. What we did uh, utilizing these mesocosm data is we, we, we use uh, in combination with equilibrium models, we calculate the free ion metals that were ex the, the um, the freon metal concentrations that were in these mesocosms, and we combine that with biotic ligand models, which track the amount of metal that accumulate in periphyton, as well as to that amount of metal that is available for accumulation by the insects. And then we turn to our USGS experts, uh, Dan Kane, Marie Noel Coteau, and Michelle Hornberger, who develop uh, these biophysical models that explain the accumulation rate of metals from dietary and aqueous sources and utilize all of these models simultaneously in a way that allows us to predict changes in, in um, ecological structure and function just based on a water sample. And we've done so to the point that we've, we've published this in a manuscript last year in um, Science of the Total Environment, where we just utilized this modeling framework and, and implemented it on mesocosm data alone. Hey, Travis, and now we're, we're we currently three minutes, three minutes left if you can, please. I'm Thanks. wrapping up here. And now awesome. we're actually in uh, in uh, writing up uh, the application of this model to Panther Creek, which is a, da uh, a multi-decade data set um, of invertebrate and metal concentrations of copper and cobalt. And we're able to predict um, the number of different taxa in space and time in that drainage area.
just by looking at uh, metal concentrations in uh, the water column. And if you have any other interest in, in this work, um, I provided a few citations here. Uh, Mari, it looks like you have your hand up. Do we have any questions? I actually have a question, Tra Travis. Um, what implications does this have in water quality standard development? I know right now we always look at independent elements in terms of meeting water quality standards and not that additive effect of uh, combining different elements. Do you know of any other states or is the EPA has any um, in terms of water quality development and meeting standards? Has anybody gone to the point of using this kind of this additive effect? Um, you know, I think the place for for accounting for the fact that that, you know, the complexity of the mixture does matter, but perhaps it's it's less than expected by adding them directly is in the safety factors. Um, <clears throat> If you don't set a safety factor uh, conservative enough, then um, you you risk not developing a standard that's quite low enough. Gotcha. Mike, do you have a question? Yeah, thanks, Travis. Um, the, do you see big differences in terms of acute versus chronic uh, exposure? Yeah, so these mesocosm experiments were 30 day exposures. Um, I've not done anything shorter than that, but I can tell you uh, in our development of this USGS tox model, um, the predictive model, um, we actually had to, um, in, the, in that development of that model, we used field data. Uh, so tissue concentrations in biofilms and insect tissues um, as an end member. And we actually had to run mathematically, we had to run our mesocosm data out um, for a longer period of time because we found that we weren't actually achieving steady state as defined by that field condition. Um, and so we adjusted the mesocosm data out longer. So the, the effects that we were describing are being mathematically extended to like six months in duration and we, we, we need to extend the exposures to that uh, duration in order to get um, good prediction of field responses. <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, the acute responses could could be totally different. Very Thank good, you, Travis. Thank you. Uh, we better wrap this one up. Thank you. Thanks, Travis. That was great. Next, we have um, Eric, if you want to start loading your presentation, I'll introduce you. This is Eric Green is a professor of wildlife biology at the University of Montana, and he is the director of UM's bird ecology lab. Along with colleagues, he has been studying ospreys in the upper Clark Fork River for over 15 years to see what they can tell us about the efforts to clean up the river. All right, can you all see and hear me? Yes, we can. Good. All right, uh, thanks everybody. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, work that my partners in crime and I have been doing along the Clark Fork River using ospreys to uh, tell us about the, the health of the river. And I'd like to also acknowledge that we're at ground zero um, in the Clark Fork system for the Salish and Kalispell people. All right, uh, ospreys are supreme fishing raptors. Uh, I like to say you just add water and you've got ospreys. They're found on every continent except uh, the Antarctic. They are really good <laughs> at doing what they're designed to do, which is catch fish. Uh, they are at the top of aquatic food chains. And this is very important for the ecotoxicology work we do. So they are eating generally large fish which are eating smaller fish and so on uh, down the food chain. And this is important uh, for our work because of this 
process of bioamplification. So um, I'm sure most of you know that as we move up uh, trophic chains in any sort of biological system, that contaminants and other things tend to concentrate. So for example, DDT levels can be very low at lower trophic levels, but as you move up, um, they can they concentrate. And this can be extreme so that, for example, top uh, predators such as ospreys in aquatic systems can have um, seven or eight orders of magnitude higher levels of whatever you're looking at than at lower uh, trophic levels. And ospreys have been important in ecotoxicology studies in aquatic systems for over 50 years. They're really, really um, ideal species to look at some of these important issues. Let me just tell you a little bit about what we've been doing. We've got a large network of uh, several hundred osprey nests scattered around the West. Um, and we've been focused, what I'm gonna tell you about uh, today is focusing on this part of the Clark Fork River, um, the Superfund uh, sections. Uh, we conduct very short alien abductions. So we go up to osprey nests using bucket trucks, uh, grab the chicks, bring them down to the ground, uh, band them, measure them, take very small blood samples and feather samples, and we make them honorary members of the now extinct uh, Osprey baseball team. Now, this is important. I just wanna point out, uh, we focus on chicks rather than adults. If you think about it, all of this biomass of this chick that we're uh, taking blood sample from, all of that biomass was grown and produced from fish caught usually within a mile or so of uh, that bird's nest. So by taking samples uh, from many nests scattered across um, watersheds, we're able to develop extremely high resolution ecotoxicology maps. Of um, And since these are top apex predators, these are really integrating ecological processes at that point in the river below them. So a very powerful way of using these birds uh, sitting at the top of the food chains. So for over the uh, past 15 years, again, we've sampled blood and feathers from chicks um, from the old, and we've uh, sampled from before, during, and after the removal of Milltown Dam and uh, during the ongoing restoration. All right, we've been concentrating on the big five heavy metals, uh, arsenic, cadmium, copper, lead, zinc, um, as well as some others, selenium and mercury. And many of you in the audience have heard me give versions of this talk over the past 15 years or so. And uh, I've usually said things like, things are looking pretty good. Um, the cleanup seems to be going well. We might have um, problems with uh, some things, especially mercury, which was, not one not of the one of metals, metals. Uh, uh, involved in the EPA designation. What I'm gonna tell you about today is, um, but I've also said that things are looking pretty good for arsenic, cadmium, copper, lead, and zinc. Um, what I'm gonna tell you today is a rather different and sobering story um, that we've just become really most concerned about this year. It appears that there's, been really pretty widespread and severe crashes in osprey populations that we're just starting to detect. And to show you this, here's what osprey nests look like. And I picked 10 years ago. So each one of these orange dots uh, represents um, an active and productive osprey nest that uh, was producing chicks. So here, right here is where the uh, Blackfoot, so here's where Milltown Dam came in right here and then all the way up to Warm Springs. So you can see that 10 years ago, there was uh, lots of osprey nests scattered along this section of the river. This next map shows the same stretch of river, but all of those X's are um, the osprey nests that had been there 10 years ago and had been regularly productive that have either been completely abandoned or are no longer producing chicks. And so you can see that uh, this is a really pretty disturbing picture compared to just 10 years ago. We're seeing um, pretty widespread 
decreases of about on the order of 60% declines in uh, some areas of the Clark Fork River. A uh, similar sort of pattern holds for, if you look at Missoula and, and downstream as well. So this is a, um, a really pretty shocking result compared to what we have been coasting along for years thinking things were pretty good, but the last few years we've started um, being concerned. What's going on? I suspect that there's multiple stressors, and I'm going to talk just about three right now. Um, climate change seems to be coming home to roost for ospreys, and I'll tell you a little bit more about arsenic and mercury as well. All right, so here's a hypothetical hydrological uh, flow graph for the good old days at the Clark Fork River, say 30 years ago. And the snowpack tended to melt uh, fairly slowly over the summer. So we had a, a nice broad hump of uh, spring water followed by uh, very cold waters um, melting out of the high snowpack uh, well into the summer. Now, this may be the new normal. Um, we're seeing that snowpacks melt off much faster, and this has a couple um, important consequences. First of all, we're tending to get larger runoffs in the spring, so some of these severe floods that we've been experiencing the last few years. And this occurs right when the osprey chicks are hatching. So this is sort of a critical time, uh, peak demand for fish, but if the Clark Fork River is just uh, chocolate pudding uh, screaming down. It's very hard for the ospreys to catch fish. And we've been seeing um, lots of chicks starve to death um, during this uh, spring runoff period. The other consequence, of course, is that we're seeing much lower flows late in the summer um, and the water getting very, very hot and uh, cooking out um, a lot of these cold water uh, fish, salmonids. Unfortunately, we've seen um, Stories like this all last summer. This is from the Bitterroot, but for many of the major rivers in Montana, we've seen stories like this of, of very high temperatures cooking out a uh, fish. And just to give you an idea of this, this is data from flow uh, meter at uh, Garrison Junction. And so you can see that by early July, the river was about 35% of the 12 year uh, sort of previous median. And the temperatures were getting uh, regularly above the upper lethal temperatures for, in this example, brown trout and cutthroat trout. And um, some of the other salmonids um, are, are much more sensitive. I was also shocked. Um, this is a photo I took on 30th of July of this year at Sager Lane. So this is the Clark Fork River just below an agricultural diversion dam uh, just above Deer Lodge. And so the Clark Fork River, it was about two inches deep and I measured the water. It was almost 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so things uh, were really pretty scary um, in sections of the Clark Fork River. Uh, what, what this means is that, and the fish biologists will be hearing from uh, some of them, the fish biologists have been telling us um, for a while that fish populations are struggling and crashing in some of these sections of the Clark Fork. So I suspect that in many areas of the Clark Fork, there's just not as much food um, around for ospreys as there had been. I'm now going to tell you a little bit more about arsenic and mercury. So on top of um, perhaps not as much food, um, we're seeing high levels, much higher levels of arsenic um, than we had been seeing for a while. Here's a map of typical arsenic levels in the blood of osprey chicks. And this is from say about 2006, 2009. The way you interpret this graph is that each one of these turquoise dots is an osprey nest. And the size of the circle is proportional to the amount of arsenic uh, in those osprey chicks. And these, these circles, even the fairly, the ones that look larger, those are okay levels of arsenic. Um, they're tolerable for the, um, for the osprey chicks. Now I'm gonna show you what happened in um, 2018 to the present. This has continued on through. 2018, um, we saw massive increases 
in arsenic levels in the blood of osprey chicks. This is um, Grant Coors Ranch at Deer Lodge. Um, and so arsenic levels went through the roof. It was um, uh, several orders of magnitude higher than it had ever been. And now if you look, there's no more of these dots until you get all the way down to Missoula. What this signifies is that uh, osprey nests had failed uh, that year all the way down to Missoula, basically. Um, these patterns of high, this was a year of very high water. And what seemed to happen is that some of these slickens got washed, uh, a, lo a lot of the slicken material up above Deer Lodge was washed into the river um, during these floods, but also by some very heavy late summer storms. So there was huge doses of arsenic and other things in 2018, and we're seeing these high levels continue through throughout. And um, Michelle, I think Michelle Hornberger and others who are looking at macros and, and fish and, and stuff are seeing similar elevated arsenic levels. Okay, so that's one thing that's happened recently. The other thing is that um, mercury is uh, through the roof in some areas of the Clark Fork River. We've spent a lot of time tracking down where that's come from. And here you can see that uh, mercury levels are um, smaller circles. Uh, this is Garrison right here, Garrison Junction. This is Flint Creek coming into the Clark Fork system. Uh, so Drummond is right here. And it turns out that uh, most of the mercury in the Clark Fork system is coming in from several old gold and silver mines uh, up behind Phillipsburg and other places. So uh, you can see from Drummond on down, very high levels of mercury um, in osprey chicks. So it's kind of uh, uh, surprising, but here's, I was flying over um, Drummond, here's little old Flint Creek, and you can jump across it in places, dumping all this mercury into the Clark Fork uh, right at Drummond. And just to give you a calibration of how severe this is, um, here is a graph showing mercury levels in osprey chick blood. Um, and the way you read this, this is from Warm Springs. So this is upriver going down towards Missoula. And you can see there's this big spike as we get to Drummond. So um, yeah, spiking and then um, continuing fairly high. These are other uh, nearby watersheds. And just for reference, this is the line, um, the upper limit for what's considered healthy mercury levels or um, the upper limit for mercury levels in human blood. Um, it's about five uh, micrograms per liter, which is about five parts per billion. So essentially, if any of us walked into our local emergency room with these mercury levels that the ospreys have in the Clark Fork system, it would be code red. They'd be, um, the doctors would starting to get very, very concerned. Okay, so lots of mercury. And whenever we go out, especially in these high mercury areas, we see, we come back with buckets of dead eggs. It looks like about half the eggs are failing to hatch in high mercury areas. All right, so fairly different talk than I've given in previous years where I've kind of said, things look great. Um, we are now seeing some serious reproductive failures of um, ospreys in some of these areas. Um, I suspect that this changing hydrology is, um, is playing a role, so we've got much more boom and bust, too much water early in the season and not enough water later on, and it's very hot. Uh, fish populations very low in some of these stretches as a result, and um, spikes in arsenic and mercury. So perhaps too little food, and the food that is there in some places is um, maybe fairly toxic. So that's an update of what the ospreys are telling us uh, for this stretch of uh, the river. Lots of people to thank. Uh, Natural Resource Damage Program has been a major supporter of this work for the last uh, 15 years or so, as well as lots of other groups. And thanks very much, and be happy to take any questions. We have about three minutes for questions. Or Eric, once again, an excellent talk. I agree that the message is a little different. 
Um, we had talked before about the anomaly that 2018 represents. Um, Fisher Young and his work um, on the Clark Fork showed that that was a year where the dissolved organic carbon concentrations just went bizarrely high came back down and we haven't seen them that high since. But it looks like your mercury numbers are persisting. Is that is that legacy or is that indicating continued high exposures? In other words, was the 2018 thing constrained in time or has you have you continued to see altered exposure? So mercury has been at these high levels uh, since we started this study. So it's uh, the mercury didn't spike in 2018. It's always been high and it continues to be about the same levels um, every year that um, at the same places. So the, yeah, it's, I, met, I, 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 met your, I met your arsenic. No, yeah, yeah. So the, it, the arsenic uh, still has remained um, high mm -hmm. since 2018. So we're not exactly sure what's going on there. We were kind of hoping for a bit of a washout, um, you know, lower levels um, after that, but we're still seeing fairly high levels um, from Deer Lodge below. And part of the problem is like um, a lot of these, as I've pointed out, a lot of these nests are just gone. So we can't, <laughs> we don't have many ospreys to tell us about um, arsenic levels anymore up there. We really have very few osprey nest to sample compared to, you know, 10 years ago. I guess uh, maybe Mike, if you have a quick question there for about a minute, that'd be great. Or not, I guess we'll wrap it up. Thank you. Oops. <laughs> Go ahead, Mike, if you have a quick question, I guess. OK, I apologize. I guess we better move on uh, to the yeah. next call. You might be having technical issues. Hey, um, Eric, do you want to unshare your screen? If it stop sharing, yeah, thank you. Great. Um, Robert, if you want to start loading up, I'll introduce you. So our next speaker is Robert Powell. He's an associate professor and the director of restoration at Montana Tech. Um, he holds a master's in agriculture and a PhD in biology and botany. His main research focus has always been the study of the flora and vegetation of disturbed habitats. That led him to work on ecological restoration and plant invasions. Robert is in charge of the Ecological Restoration MS program, the Restoration Certificate, and the Native Plant Restoration Program at Montana Tech. He was recently elected as Vice President of the Montana Native Plant Society. Okay. Can, every, can everybody see and um, hear me? Yes. And the presentation, great. most importantly. Looks great. OK, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so good uh, day, everyone. I am really uh, delighted to talk um, during this forum. I uh, would like to talk today about riparian habitat monitoring. And uh, this is an ongoing work funded by uh, the NRDP directly. And so I would like to special thank to them right at this uh, point. As we speak, actually, Gabriella Popart, who is my co-author uh, in this uh, talk, she's actually using an XRF with 200 miles per hour because we just have it for uh, today and tomorrow. So we need to go through a bunch of um, uh, samples to analyze for soils uh, for these habitats. But anyways, I just wanted to also appreciate uh, her work in this whole monitoring. So <clears throat> cleanup, as everybody knows in this group, is an ongoing process along uh, the Upper Clark Fork. Uh, however, there's also still another 30 miles of river that still needs to be addressed, and uh, there will be ongoing need for monitoring. 
Uh, <clears throat> so in 2018, the NRDP spearheaded uh, the qualitative re uh, rapid assessment for the completed phases, which is one, two, and five, and six. And you can see a map here on the right, and that actually addresses most of those phases. It's a little bit of a dated map because right now phase three is in the working, and the picture that is in the left was just taken at the field trip <clears throat> two or three weeks ago uh, that we did with our students. So it's a, it's a good progress um, and work is just uh, really going great. So, um, but with that uh, qualitative rapid assessment, um, the, the goal was to establish a cost effective framework to monitor important components of the cleanup. But uh, the monitoring data collected to date has not been robust enough to evaluate really the effectiveness of the remediation and restoration efforts. Uh, <clears throat> and that actually brings up uh, further uh, questions. Uh, as, uh, as, as we understand the Superfund cleanup uh, progresses, it's really essential for future designs to integrate, adapt, and learn from the successes and also the failures that previous phases of the uh, cleanup had. So this picture shows us uh, with a student and Amy Sacre being out at phase one when we started this monitoring efforts uh, this summer. Uh, <clears throat> this adaptive management, as we should call it, uh, is being addressed across the globe and, uh, and it's uh, a really important component and it should be a really important component of the whole uh, Clark for cleanup. Adaptive management is driven by data and information that is um, uh, that should be more robust and also not just qualitative but also quantitative. And that's where we are trying to help uh, this understand this adaptive management cycle and improve it with evaluating and learning about it. Um, for example, there is still a good number of pending questions about riparian habitat development after the cleanup. For example, what plant species and vegetation community types occur in each phases after uh, and, and how they are distributed within a phase? And what factors uh, drive vegetation community developments? Uh, another word is slide. So I would say there is a desperate need to establish a long term floodplain and riparian monitoring uh, framework to actually address all these things and everybody can read the rest. And again, that's where we are trying to help. So based on the need of this long term monitoring framework, um, our program has two components, a stream bank, uh, monitoring that focuses on the evaluation of different stream bank treatments after the remediation and restoration of the Clark Fork River. And I'm not addressing that uh, component of our monitoring today. And the second one is the floodplain and riparian uh, <clears throat> monitoring that is related to ecological background conditions also on the floodplain. Uh, so for this, as we saw a picture before, we started this monitoring and our approach is to monitor the riparian habitats following the design cover types that were intended to be present after the cleanup and the restoration efforts. And this is important because they are based on <clears throat> geomorphic location, uh, design, elevation, distance from the river, and include uh, major as-built features such as wetlands, point bars, and floodplain terraces. So we see uh, a couple of those cover types uh, in this uh, slide. Uh, also a map with those designed uh, cover types on the right at phase two. And so our approach to monitoring uh, this the outcome, uh, we were targeting phase one, two, four, and five, and six, and um, we actually did uh, select our our uh, plots based on those design cover types. But also in the field, we needed to keep our eyes open because since those were established, 
things as lab dish, things really changed a lot. So sometimes a cover type that intended to be a herbaceous cover type, but maybe the elevations were set a little lower. So it now became uh, an emergent wetland. So we needed to actually be very aware of these situations. So what we did, we selected, we randomized and stratified uh, with the help of GEUM, the site, and uh, we localized the plots that we are trying to survey. And when we identified them, we surveyed first of a 10 meter diameter area for gen general habitat assessment of a broader scale vegetation, of broader scale vegetation characteristics, such as shrubs, trees, grass, litter, bare ground, and so on. You see a little slice of our uh, data sheets here. And in the center of this 10 meter uh, bigger plot, we made a much smaller, more detailed one by one meter plot where we addressed uh, further uh, information about the substrate that actually is uh, facing us. And we also did a really detailed vascular species uh, survey. And uh, further, I would say we also did a really detailed soil collection and analysis, what we could do in the field. We investigated, for example, uh, depth to alluvium, soil compaction, soil color, texture, structure that were again easy to do in the field. And we collected uh, <clears throat> lots of soils um, to analyze in the lab. And we are, you know, we are sending part of them in into a lab and also trying to use our sensors uh, that we have in our labs here at uh, Montana Tech and trying to get the best out of them. So a couple of first results. So this data set is in the making. I actually, from the students, got a finalized version of the <clears throat> data set just the day before. So I really just put things into R and try to make some really quick uh, out, produce a couple of really quick uh, figures. For example, the one that I uh, actually am showing here, which is uh, representing the different habitat, the cover types that we were uh, surveying. You see them herbaceous, low shrub, point bars, and so forth. And we are, are simply just seeing the species numbers uh, in the investigated phases uh, and, and detailed by the, the cover types. And we can definitely see uh, that point bars were among the most species rich uh, cover types, which is really interesting. Point bars are kind of built, but also they're built by nature, by the river as a, as a dynamic system. So it carries and takes seeds away uh, and propagules, but it's probably the easiest for, for plants to settle. And I'm just kind of emphasizing here uh, a point bar situation uh, where two of the uh, willow ducks species uh, can be seen and a couple of nice representatives of the flora. Definitely wetlands uh, and herbaceous vegetations, which kind of are more of a dry grasslandy um, area are the most uh, species poor with me wet meadows, but wetlands and wet meadows, they're many times just dominated by one or two species like uh, a sedge or a, or a rush and not really much, or sometimes, you know, if uh, the cattails are dominant in those two. <clears throat> the next one, people might be interested, how is the noxious weed the situation out there? This is coverage in the 10 by 10 meter, the, the 10 meter diameter plots of the noxious weeds. And there's not too, it's not a very interesting figure, but I just wanted to bring it up. This is quite a, a uh, big of a scatter of the data. For example, phase two definitely seems to be more impacted by invaders. And I just have again a couple of uh, pictures of the most um, frequent and also abundant species uh, in the different phases that we address. Leafy spurge, for example, among them, and uh, Canada thistle. And definitely, if people are working out there, you must have seen a lot of uh, sweet clover. So that is um, I definitely, I would say, an issue. Another thing that I would emphasize here uh, would be vegetative ground cover, which, you know, if we do restoration, many times I just call ourselves, we are really putting the icing on the cake with, uh, with putting vegetation on top of the cleanup or a, or a cap in our situation. And <clears throat> we want to see how 
it will be covered by by plants. Um, and then again, I just have a breakdown here for the vegetative ground cover by the cover types, seeing again the same kind of cover types. And interestingly, uh, you know, we showed point bars the most species rich, and these are again just box plots, box and whiskers uh, showing what we can see. But as you remember, maybe wetlands and wet meadows were the most species poor ones, but they're really having a lot of coverage out there. Uh, and you see in this picture um, a cattail dominated uh, little patch with two of the students uh, performing the survey. Okay, and um, as again, as I said, this data set is just ready and we will be do a lot of uh, analysis of them. But I would like to also emphasize that there was a little bit of a history for our surveys. So last year, uh, with in hand in hand with the bird lab uh, from Missoula, Eric Green's uh, team, we helped for analyzing habitats for for their different bird po bird points, bird survey points, and this is just data that reflects 2020 situation and more com more complex of an analysis. And here we asked, uh, how is the cleanup helping? Uh, the shrub cover in the con in a controlled situation <clears throat> and were in a control situation where there was no cleanup and there where was cleanup. And everybody who looks at maps, you can see that, well, yeah, even from Google Earth, you can see that in the control areas, which we didn't touch, they have more shrubs. And that is really visible in our survey. But what is also interesting, if we break that down onto the figure to the right, uh, now we have the control, which was phase four and three last year, and then we have uh, other cleaned up and restored areas, uh, phase one till six. And I just actually pointed out the dates when they were finished, and I would definitely say that the the young, the, the older the site, they're definitely getting closer uh, with shrub cover uh, to the control. So. It is working. We probably just need to add time to it. So definitely, if you look at 2014, is far from the control, but is it's already significantly different from, for example, 2015 and 16 cleanups. And this figure shows uh, data where we compared um, shrub cover in regards in relationship with the distance from river. And uh, you can see blue sh shows reclaimed areas and uh, red points show uh, non-reclaimed areas, so control areas. And what we see from here that, uh, you know, how basically the pattern of um, putting in, for example, willow cuttings were in the, in the restored phases, because definitely uh, 0, 0 0.0 is just right at the river. So next to the river in the reclaimed areas, there is just a lot of willows, lots of shrubs in a way. As we go further, we kind of losing that. So restoration still needs to work a couple of years, decades, who knows how long to actually fill in to the level where the, the non-reclaimed areas were uh, again showed by red here, um, which it's more like willows are more everywhere, not just right next to the river. And so people might be interested, well, these guys surveyed soils. And again, we are analyzing those data, but just a couple of observations from the field. We use this soil compaction meter, and I could definitely say, as we actually got further from the river, especially to the herbaceous cover type, um, compaction got really, really tough. And we sometimes could, hardly put in that compaction meter to a couple of inches. That is not really good for plants. Uh, on the other hand, where wetlands, uh, you know, with a little bit of a power, we, we just made that uh, device sunk and uh, shows that, you know, it actually a habit that kind of really makes it um, the, the soil compaction different. You see here soil pits because we also did soil pits in, um, in these different uh, phases and in the different cover types and we wanted to see whether groundwater is there or not we definitely observed a lot of groundwater coming even in this uh, dry year 
coming close to surface in the wetland and emergent wetland situations. And also, if you kind of look at those black and uh, reddish colored hoping knot, it's not contamination, of course, redox processes and the black carbon. Uh, I'm holding here a little bit of a piece of a black carbon um, showing wetland soil development. My time is getting over, I guess. So uh, also you can see a core here. Many times you were wondering what, how are the soil horizons uh, developing? Uh, for example, organic horizons were only to be seen probably at phase one, but then as you know, the younger the cleanups became, that kind of disappeared and we saw sometimes maybe a millimeter or two of a darker layer, but then that disappeared. Uh, so very interesting. We're analyzing again this and trying to put into a relationship with the vegetation. So I would say uh, stay tuned. More is coming. And I feel this work would really help uh, the further for for right now, those 30 miles that are coming, um, what to take into consideration, what works, what what doesn't, um, what dangers could they be out there? Uh, maybe there are some techniques that are making sites more prone to invasion. So there's a lot of questions we could answer um, by this analysis, but I'm just coming to the end. I will thank you for your attention. And I also need to thank to, um, to again, Natural Resource Damage Program, to Montana Tech, Amy Sacre from GEOM to help us to actually perform uh, certification and all those students who were out with us in the field. Thank you so much. Thanks, Robert. We have maybe one minute for a question. No questions? I'll ask a quick one if it's all right. Um, are you seeing much in the way of biotic crusts and are you quantifying those? Yes, yes, we do that. Uh, ben, is that you? Yep, that's me. Yes, so so yes, uh, that's a very good question. We do see uh, bio crusts moving in, like if it, if it needs a little explanation, so lichens, mosses, uh, blue and green algae. Definitely blue and green algae, for example, gets more activated in several locations. But yes, we see also a development that of that also with time, I would say. But also the presence of moisture many times just makes it, you know, more happy of a site, for example, for mosses. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for everyone. I unshare my screen. Thank you. Great. Um, ben, if you want to load up your presentation, I will introduce you. So next we have Ben Coleman. He's an associate professor of aquatic ecosystem ecology in the Frank College of Forestry and Conservation at the University of Montana. Ben is broadly interested in element cycling and how chemical change in ecosystems influences ecosystem structure and function. And we can see you. Great. All right. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Melissa. Thanks, everybody, for your attention. Um, the title of my talk today is Metals in the UCF are more than meets the eyes. I'm hoping to transform, if you will, the, the, the way you look at metals and, and arsenic in the river. I'd like to thank, before I start, uh, several students of mine, Kate Perkins, Dylan White, and Chelsea Wazotsky, who've all contributed to this work, as well as a range of other collaborators at UM um, and Montana State. And I'd like to thank a, a variety of funding sources who have made this work uh, possible. So if we start with sort of the ways that we measure metals and arsenic, we think of them in terms of being in particle and dissolved forms. We measure the total recoverable. So that's everything that we can get out of the uh, whole water sample with a bit of acid. Uh, if we filter that water sample and measure it, then we're looking at the dissolved fraction. And, and to give sort of a, more of a schematic of this, the way we can think of this is here's our total recoverable metals. If we could actually see what, what's in there, we've got these small ions with charges, we've got particles. And if we put those through a filter, we end up with this particulate fraction and this dissolved fraction. And we sort of assume that that dissolved fraction is going to be mostly free ions and that this particulate fraction 
uh, it's going to be these big honking particles. And if we think about sort of the availability of these two organisms, we think of these big particles as being largely unavailable and these small ions as being the form that's largely available. Now, this is all well and good, but it's also not completely accurate or, or, or maybe it's highly inaccurate. Um, if we think about the types of constituents we find in the river and we think about particles we've got, our big particles like cobbles, gravel, sand, and silt. And then once we get into the range, which I've defined here based on my preferred filter of choice as being smaller than 700 nanometers, that's that dissolved fraction, you'll see that it, it almost completely corresponds with the colloidal fraction, which is one to a thousand nanometers. These are very small particles, overlaps all of the nanoparticle range, which is carved out from that colloidal range and overlaps most of the, the range on a log scale at least of clay particles. And so we know that small particles are getting through our filter. And so perhaps a more accurate representation of what we're seeing in these systems is something that looks a little more like this. So our dissolved fraction, is it really dissolved? Well, yeah, there's some ions, there's some particles. Now we can tease this apart a little bit. Um, we can use a, a smaller filter and then we can separate the colloidal particles from the truly dissolved. And so we have this historically what we've called the dissolved fraction. We could separate it into a colloidal fraction and a truly dissolved fraction. And so that would look something you know, going with this schematic a little bit more like this. And so in terms of what organisms are exposed to and in terms of the relative bioavailability of these different forms that are in this dissolved fraction, this poses some questions. And um, we, can, we can talk about these different routes of exposure. And so we have, uh, and Travis talked about some of this earlier, we have these free ions that are what historically we've mostly thought of as being the main driver of exposure and the main driver through aquatic exposure and that uh, uptake of those ions is then balanced by excretion. Um, and we've considered for small particles, we probably don't need to worry about those. Well, work in the field of engineered nanomaterials, uh, looking at small particles in this nano and colloidal size range have shown that um, sulfides and oxides of different uh, elements can actually be taken up by the gills as well. And not only that, from work by uh, several folks in this meeting and other folks from the Menlo Park uh, USGS group, we know that accumulation of metals via whatever pathway they take into paraffin and into biofilms, into macroalgae in the river, can then lead to dietary exposure, either direct dietary exposure for grazers um, or also uh, exposure to higher trophic levels. And so really, what I'm going to focus on today is not uh, looking at how these contribute to exposure, that's that's ongoing work, but looking at the differentiation between these different forms in time and space and, and, and trying to tease apart what we're looking at. And specifically, I'll focus on these two questions. Uh, what To what extent are different elements in, in filtered water found as colloidal particles? And what are these particles composed of and how big are they? So the second one's kind of a two-part question. So to answer this first question, we sampled and we've been sampling uh, through efforts funded by the NSF through the LTREB program and the EPSCOR program. We've been sampling 13 sites along the Upper Clark Fork River. I'll present two years of those data today. We bring, uh, we, we process in the field and do some processing in the lab to generate these two different size fractions or filter fractions, our filtered water and our ultra filtered water filtered is that 0.7 micron or 700 nanometer nominal pore size filter ultra filtered is less than one nanometer. And then we calculate these size fractions, the colloidal fraction, which is one to hundred nanometer. And that's just our filtered water minus the ultra filtered. And then our truly dissolved solutes, that's the easy one. That's just the ultra filtered concentration. So what goes through that filter? I'm not gonna present all of the elements, uh, but we'll, we'll group elements into two categories, potential vectors and toxic pollutants. So the, uh, the potential vectors, these are things like iron, aluminum, manganese, metals that commonly form oxides or sulfides and, and have a lot of surface area and can absorb a range of other elements, including toxic pollutants. And then we'll also consider toxic pollutants. I'm gonna consider a subset here of those of interest in the Clark Fork, so arsenic, cadmium, copper, and lead. And in terms of the data I'm gonna to present to you, I'm not gonna focus on the overall concentrations, but I wanna focus on this metric here, that percent colloidal. So what, 
what component of the fraction is found in that colloidal concentration relative to everything that goes in that filter, the concentration of what goes through the, the first filter. So that's your colloidal and your truly dissolved. And what do we see? So let's start with the potential vectors. For the vectors and, and for the other plots, so I'll show you the same type of plot where we have distance on the x-axis, we've got time on the y-axis, we've got sort of this uh, heat map representing the percent colloidal. All the dots are sampling uh, points for all the different sites uh, when we got all of the different fractions and we're not hindered by ice. And then we also have uh, these dashed lines, which represent sort of that peak flow. If you remember back to the, the stormwater snowmelt graphs that Eric showed. Thanks, Eric. Um, and so we have iron, aluminum, and manganese here. And we also have these five sites along the Clark Fork to help situate people. Um, and what we see is that for iron and aluminum, well, the dominant form seems to be colloidal for much of this time period um, and for the more recent years for the majority of that time period. Um, aluminum, we see a little bit more variability in terms of that percent colloidal over time. And then when we look at manganese, we see a much uh, lower percentage of manganese in that filtered fraction is colloidal. We also see an interesting sort of hot spot in, in time and space here. Um, if we then switch to looking at the, uh, but in general, we see lower, lower percent colloidals for manganese. If we switch then to the toxics, um, we see for lead, arsenic, copper, and cadmium. For lead, uh, initially our, our, our resolution at the low end wasn't good enough with the instrument that we're using to measure these samples, especially for that truly dissolved fraction. Um, once we started getting reliable data, we can see that the majority of the lead is in that colloidal fraction. Um, copper is quite variable. We see times when most of the copper is truly dissolved and other times when the majority of the copper is in that colloidal fraction. And then arsenic and cadmium uh, team, seem to be in general more in the truly dissolved fraction, less in the colloidal fraction, although there are some periods of time uh, which sort of align with what we saw in manganese, where we see a higher proportion of arsenic and cadmium. Uh, understanding the drivers of these are uh, is part of our, our future work. Um, so in terms of answering this first question, what extent are different elements in filtered water bound as colloidal or found as colloidal particles? Well, I would say that iron, aluminum, and lead are mostly colloidal. Uh, manganese, arsenic, copper, and cadmium are somewhat colloidal, they all have periods of time when, when the majority of, of those elements is in the colloidal fraction, uh, but it may not be for the majority of the time that the majority of those elements is in the colloidal fraction. And then we see that the percent colloidal varies both temporally and spatially, with the temporal variation being very notable. Now, sort of going to the next level and looking at, at what, are the, what, what are these particles composed of and how big are they? This is work by Kate Perkins, a, a former master's student of mine. This is her thesis work in which she sampled eight sites in the Upper Clark Fork River from Warm Springs down to Garrison. She analyzed them in collaboration uh, with uh, Dr. Manuel Montano and Dr. Frank von der Kammer at the University of Vienna. Uh, Manuel was doing a postdoc there and analyzed it using a technique called single particle inductively coupled plasma time of flight mass spectrometry, which is a big way of saying that basically it, it is a technique that allows one to look at the individual elemental components that make up these nanoparticles and, and colloidal particles. So it's, it's a way to actually tease apart the composition of those. What did we find? Well, the, the quick answer is we found there were 144 different particle types. I'm not going to show all of them to you. I'll just show you the top 20% of particle types. Uh, this represented 99% of the particles by number across these sites. And if you look at this graph, we've got all the different particle types on the x-axis with the element symbols showing what all is uh, detected in those particles. And then this is just the count of the number of particles of each of those particle types. If you look at these, you'll see that some are single element particles. We have some two element particles, some three element particles. If we look at sort of the, the, the distribution of elements along this uh, graph, we see that the top, uh, the dominant particles are iron, manganese, and, and manganese-iron uh, combined particles. 
If we delve into it a little bit more and look at single element particles, we see that single element particles in general are more abundant. There are a lot more different types of single element particles than there are of multi element particles. And then finally, the last thing I want you to come away from this with is that iron is found in almost all of the multi element particles, which is sort of consistent with this role that we were expecting it might have as sort of a vector of these different elements. And the one exception is down here, which is this manganese lead particle, which uh, has manganese in it, suggesting that manganese may also be playing a role as a vector. Finally, if we look at the size of these particles, uh, and we can do this by making certain assumptions based on the amount of moles or atom moles, as the case may be, in each of these particles for each of these elements, and we make certain pretty reasonable assumptions about the dominant species for these different, um, different compounds and how, um, uh, how they're arranged. Namely, we said they're all spherical. We can estimate the particle size, and what we come up with is that these particles are very small. So here's the, the 100 nanometer cutoff for nanoparticles, and you'll see that for most of these different elements or, or, or multi-element particles, uh, they have at least a portion of their distribution. These are violin plots, so they're sort of a histogram coupled with a dot plot coupled with a bar and whisker plot. They show sort of the density of those data. Most of them have at least part of the distribution down in that nanoparticle size range. Many of them, as indicated by these black lines across, have their median down in the nanoparticle size range. So a lot of these particle, particles are really small in that size range where organisms may be accumulating them both through dietary pathways and potentially through aquatic exposure as well. Finally, uh, the other bit of information we can get here is we can pull apart these different single element and multi element particles and see how big they are in general. So how big are single element, dual element and three element particles. And in general, we see this increase in size as we start adding elements to particles. Now, what we don't know here is that is whether that's just what we see in, in this system, that uh, the only particles that have multiple elements are those that are bigger in size or more likely it's also partially due to our ability to detect these elements with this technique and that we need a, enough of each of the elements that go into the recipe of these multi-element particles in order to be able to detect them. So in summary, what are these particles and how big are they? Well, we see a diverse variety of different particle types. Uh, we see that iron and manganese particles are abundant and we do see evidence of iron and even manganese serving as vectors of some of these toxic elements as well as for one another. And if we think about the, the, the particles that we see, the majority of these particles, uh, at least numerically, are in that nanoparticle range. So in terms of thinking of what organisms are exposed to and what that might mean, um, and in thinking about some of these models that do a really good job of predicting exposure, do they do that by happenstance or it, it are some of the same parameters that are driving the success of those models also uh, driving the distribution of elements among these different size fractions. So finally, a couple of quick emerging questions. One, how do these colloidal particles and truly dissolved solutes spiral? How do they move through this river system? Um, ask me after the winter, I hope to have an answer to that. And then finally, what's the bioavailability of these colloidal and truly dissolved particles? And this is something that we're going to pursue in uh, collaboration with Travis, uh, who showed you his mesocosms. That's a, a perfect tool for going after this. So with that, I thank you for your attention. Uh, Mari, I see your hands up. Did you have a question? No, I, I have my hands up. It's because I don't know how to bring to take it down. You're just stretching. <laughs> no, no, but uh, again, Ben, I know you've heard this from me before. Interesting stuff and lots of great opportunity. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Marie. Hey, Ben, it's Marie. Um, I, I come on your work. It's very, very exciting and fascinating information. And I think moving forward, especially after Travis talk, you know, the work we've been doing with the modeling, I mean, this information really inform our modeling and how, which variable we need to consider when predicting accumulation and possibly toxicities. If most of the metal is in the colloidal form or particulate form, dietary is likely important and we need to focus on that. So uh, 
kudo that's great work and looking forward to uh, interacting more with you on that yeah for certain thank you marie Yeah, I mean, it would be really interesting to model the speciation. Another thing that we've talked about doing, you know, we, you know, there's multiple factors that might be driving this distribution between colloidal and, and truly dissolved forms. And certainly thinking about using some of these speciation models to model what we might predict and then what we're actually seeing could be interesting to see if if those concentrations are sort of be in equilibrium in the in the in the stream or do we have this source of one form or the other that's sort of constantly knocking them out of equilibrium? Um, and how does that drive exposure to organisms? No, absolutely. I, I, I look forward to introduce you to one of my colleagues, Kate Campbell, who does um, solid phase speciation. And I think that moving forward, this is something we'll be looking at. So um, let's stay tuned. We're going to talk. All right. Sounds good. Any other questions? All right, great. Thank you, Ben. That was great. Thank you. So we are going to take a break. Um, just a, a mini change in the agenda. Well, not a change in the agenda. Um, it looks like I'm going to put up the new agenda. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, so we have a break for at three o'clock and then we we were scheduled to have um, Matt Trenton, Trentman speak at 310. However, he um, cannot be with us today. So we're actually going to take a longer break so you can get out, run around the block a little bit, get some blood back flowing through your limbs and we will meet back here at 330. I will keep this up so that those who may be join in or are looking to join and in there's a i'm sorry go ahead hello marie did you have a comment okay so um yeah so you guys can just come back at 3 30. um feel free to talk amongst yourself if you want if you want to use this platform or um we'll keep it open and we'll keep just remember that you're being recorded <laughs> so but we will meet back here at 3 30 and we will uh see what uh, alicia has to show us so have a nice break
Just a reminder that our 310 presentation um, is has been canceled and we will start again. We're going to take a longer break and we will start again at 330. For those of you who may have joined us at some uh, some point.
Looking good, Rob.
We will be starting up in about five minutes. Hi, Alicia. Hello, how's it going? Yeah, it looks like you are all ready to go. Okay, perfect. Yeah, let's give it a few more seconds and um, sure. And I will introduce you. Okay. Let me get that all open. Sounds good. So everybody sees the side by side view because I picked that. Is that what? Is that is if that um, we haven't been doing that? We just oh. been. Um, I don't know. I suppose it's okay. Why not? <laughs> well, I, just, I, I didn't. I, I don't. I don't know what exactly you're seeing. So you're seeing my screen and you're seeing me, right? Yep, we're seeing okay. your screen and you. Okay, that's fine. 
Um, all right. So this is Alicia Cox, and she is a geobiochemist uh, and associate professor at Montana Tech Department of Chemistry and Geochemistry and the faculty director of the New Earth Science. Ooh, the New Earth Science. That's exciting. And engineering PhD program at Tech. Oh, I'm super excited about that. It's great for yeah. Montana. Great for Montana. Wonderful. Um, all right, take it away. Okay, thank you, Melissa. Um, and so today I'm, uh, my lab is at Tech. We're the Laboratory Exploring Geobiochemical Engineering and Natural Dynamics. And what you're gonna see today is uh, the results from some of our uh, work looking at some metagenomes and a lot of environmental observations. And I'm not really gonna get to the theoretical predictions so much uh, today uh, in the Upper Clark Fork Headwaters. So uh, this is work done by students in my lab, master's students, undergraduate students, um, and we started in November of 2015, and we've been sampling every three months uh, since November of 2015, collecting full geochemical data. Um, and we are having select areas that we have metagenomes extracted from. Uh, we are, our collaborator uh, that's really good at metagenomes is from University of Minnesota Duluth. That's Cody Sheik there. Everybody else is a Montana Tech master's student or a undergraduate student uh, listed here as a co-author. So here are some, um, here are some of the things that you see. All right, so when we go out, we sample full water chemistry and we're looking for uh, microbial uh, activity uh, to link to the water chemistry. And so we'll do meters out there for temperature, pH, conductivity, um, dissolved oxygen. We'll do some field spectrophotometry. Uh, we do dissolved silica for field spectrophotometry. We do an alkalinity titration, uh, for example. And then we collect a bunch of water to bring back to the lab to measure for cations, anions, dissolved inorganic carbon, dissolved organic carbon. Um, we actually just got a new well we have a we had an nsf mri got funded so we have a new ic system for channel ic being installed uh, next week for cations anions organic acids and the fourth channel will probably be arsenate arsenite so if people are interested in collaborating and want to use our new instrument please let us know uh, we also collect uh, a little bit of the sediment to extract microbial um, DNA and proteins out of. We've gotten to some of the DNA, haven't gotten to a lot of proteins uh, yet, but we will. Uh, we also collect um, water uh, and get the microbes in the water on filters as well, which is what you see in the bottom right uh, corner uh, here today. So... Uh, we do a lot of different uh, work in our lab. So we have pH uh, on the y-axis and temperature on the x-axis. And the upper Clark Fork is in the upper left of this diagram. We also do look at um, geochemistry and microbiology in systems from Yellowstone, you know, all the way to the upper Clark Fork. And so these are some of the data points that we have uh, in our lab. And we have full geochemistry at each of these points, as well as samples for microbial activity um, and identity as well. So today we're going to talk about the upper Clark Fork. Uh, this is a map of what it looks uh, of where we sample in particular. Uh, so we s use our control as um, Thompson up here, and then we sample some in Butte, in Butte area one. Uh, we sample Whiskey Gulch, like so Santa right outside of Butte. We sample German Gulch area because of the historical isolation for the fish population, which is cool. We sample above and below Warm Springs. Um, and then we sample uh, Garrison, where the Little Blackfoot comes in, and then uh, below at Drummond, where the uh, Flint comes in. And so those are the sites that uh, we are usually sampling. Uh, one of my students is working on, um, uh, so he's working here on September of 2018, uh, kind of all the way to the present. These are shaded by season, so winter is white. Uh, spring is blue, summer is green, and fall is orange here. And so we are, um, you know, sampling each season, um, and we have a, a data point from each of those. So uh, the data that we're going to see microbial is not from this one, but this is an example of what has been going on. The line here is where the input from the uh, treated Berkeley pit water has been put in, and so we see increases in conductivity all the way through to Warm Springs, and less so uh, below Warm Springs uh, for the conductivity there. So the top here is blacktail. We've got um, above and below, so at the KOA, if you're familiar with the Butte area, and then we call Slag Canyon for, well, Slag Canyon here, or KOA, and then Slag Canyon, um, which is at the Montana Street Station uh, there, and then these are our other samples that are on Silverbow Creek, and then these are Upper Clark Fork, so below Warm Springs. So this is just an example of some of the historical um, data that, that we have. Okay. 
Uh, so let's go to the samples that we're going to be looking at today. So these are some of the data from November 2015 to November 2017. So we got a yearly cycle. We got temperature on the x-axis and pH on the y-axis. Uh, and so we still have, have everything within the EPA aquatic life zone uh, here. And then the winter samples are cold. It's you know zero degrees when we're sampling in February. The November samples are here, May uh, and August uh, in general. And so what do we have for DNA? Well, we have extracted a bunch of DNA from these 18 places and so we sent it all off and we have 18 uh, metagenomes and we just got them last uh, well two weeks ago uh, now um, the DNA was extracted I think in 2017 2018 got sent off sequence and that's been sitting on servers in Duluth for a while during the pandemic but now we have access to it and so we're working on processing it we're learning how to process it and each one of these has a um, six billion bases so six gigabases per location of dna for us to deal with and figure out what's going on with so we have only scratched the surface of what we can do uh, with all of these uh, dna uh, and data and so today we're going to look particularly at two sites uh, at the koa which is on blacktail creek kind of um, above where um, the input uh, is now from the ber treated Berkeley pit wastewater. So um, we're gonna look at a you know, warmer sample and a February sample uh, as well and see what we can see so far there. Okay, so again, here we are on the map. We're looking um, at Blacktail Creek up here uh, in Butte area one um, location. All right, what does it look like when we sample this? So in February of 2016, this is uh, what it looked like. There was some snow, uh, not a ton. Um, we sampled right out towards the middle, usually a little further out in the middle of the flow. And so the sample um, is going to be from the top bit of the sediment for the biology. And then we take the geochemistry from just above uh, where we are sampling. And uh, well, what do we see? So of all the DNA that we extracted, look over here on the right on the fraction classified. So we used, a, we were, right now we're working on a program, um, an online platform called KBase, and they have a program called CanDo on that, which goes and it is um, identifying the reads uh, of DNA that we have. And so of all of the DNA that we have from this site, uh, only about a quarter of it is classified. Okay, so this is about 25% of the DNA is identified. So 75% of the DNA from this site in February at that time is not classified uh, anywhere uh, through here. Uh, this is at the phylum level. And so over here we have uh, the different phyla uh, that we found. And now we will look at uh, the percent uh, of the classified reads. So on the left, this is from zero to 100% of, of the classified reads. So it's this fraction over here, this 25%, we're identifying what's in that 25% and blowing it up to 100% here uh, on the left. Uh, the top, we have a couple percent that are unassigned at the phylum level. There's a little bit of virus, it's hard to see in here. I think this one had like 846 uh, hits on, on virus uh, reads. And then this is uh, the tail up here. We'll see the, the tail, quote unquote, a little bit more with the, um, with the species level, uh, but this is, uh, phyla that belong to that are less than five percent of the total so it would basically blow up our chart if we listed every single one that we saw in there and so that's like you know a couple percent five to seven percent there and then these are all of the other phyla that we see from proteobacteria making up most of it to bacteroides actinobacteria uh, playing to my CDs, vermicutes, et cetera, uh, all on down. So there's some interesting things in here. We've got um, uh, Euarchaeota, so we've got Archaea in there. Um, I have to figure out what's going on with this, this Ignavibacteriaceae. They um, they were originally isolated from hot springs, so I'm not sure why we're seeing them here. Very microbial. I know that we've been finding those from serpentinizing systems to pH2 stuff, so that's an interesting one for us to look more at. And again, this is just one way of looking at the data. Um, one program uh, is showing us that they can identify 25% of the DNA that we have in this sample, and this is the phyla that they are associated with. Okay, next, um, the that same set of DNA, but at the species level. So again, 25% of the DNA is classified at the species level, and we see all these sorts of different species. So here we have more in the tail, right? So we've got 20% of these are assigned at the species level, so they were assigned at higher levels. And then most of this stuff here is less than 0.5% of the total. So if we listed these all out, there would be lots and lots and lots of organisms um, in there, which shows kind of great diversity. So we'll figure out how to analyze all this. But these are some of the ones that make up more than 0.5% down here. Dechloromonas, those are the things that actually eat organic compounds, which is cool, crazy things like benzene and toluene. And then I thought this was cool for the rotifax ferroreducent. 
we got some iron reduction going on um, in the top of the sediment uh, in February uh, in the creek, um, and then all sorts of other um, species that we have uh, identified. So let's look over um, at this same sample, but this time uh, in August of 2016 there. And so in August, right, the creek looks a little bit different, right? We've got some uh, organisms that are growing, more photosynthesis happening uh, at this time. And what do we see here? We're just going to look at the species for this one and kind of compare it. Uh, so we actually can identify more here. So this program identified about half of the DNA uh, in August. Maybe there's less cold-loving things identified in the databases, you know, at this point, less work done in cold places, although that has been changing. Um, and let's look at the full, the percent of the DNA that is already uh, classified. So of that half of the DNA that's classified, um, again, about 20% of it is unassigned at the species level. And then we have a whole bunch of things that only make up half a percent uh, or less. So there's a lot of diversity. And then we actually see different organisms uh, in here. Down here, it looks like we have some organisms that are eating chitin, which is, which is pretty cool. Uh, for organisms that are uh, eating chitin, uh, as well as things that we would expect to find um, in the summer sort of stuff. So um, that is a little bit uh, of what we've done. We've only scratched the surface. We haven't analyzed um, all of them using this program yet. Most of them we have. So that 0.25% is actually the lowest uh, fraction classified that we have, is that one February one so far. I think we have we just got a bunch of these analyzed very recently, but this is all that I had time to uh, tell you about uh, today. And so we're all into linking microbial uh, activity uh, with the geochemistry um, along the Upper Clark Fork. And we're, again, we're out there every three months uh, from Thompson Park uh, all the way down to Drummond doing this. So if anyone wants to overlap with us or collaborate, we're totally into that sort of thing. Uh, this is my current lab uh, in the middle. Uh, the right are co-authors you know, on this talk for the most part that have done work uh, um, on this project uh, exactly. And then undergraduate researchers uh, as well over here uh, on the left have been out uh, and sampling with us. And we need to thank all of the people uh, that have gone out sampling. This isn't everybody. I don't think I got everybody on this uh, list. This isn't, isn't big enough, but my environmental chem class comes out and samples with us uh, as well. Um, and all sorts of people um, come out with us. And this is an incomplete slide. Needs to add more people uh, on there. And uh, the funding for this has come from the Montana uh, Water Center and the and NRDP program, uh, as well as the Montana University System, Montana Institute on Ecosystems, some internal grants um, from tech uh, as well. Um, and then the um, University of Minnesota, Co Cody used a little bit of his startup money to help us finish paying for our uh, metagenomic data. And if you're interested in looking at more of our work on the creek that we have out there so far, Isaiah did his uh, thesis in 2019 on uh, experiments that he did in the creek on limitations of photosynthesis um, in the creek. And that's we have it under review at Limnology and Oceanography for we cut it down into a manuscript. Jonathan Feldman did chemical speciation that are associated with these metagenome data, actually. So he did the geochemistry part. Now we're going to work on integrating that. And then I had a student graduate last year that Ann Morse, she looked at wild um, metal contents in basin wild rye in restored and unrestored areas uh, along the creek. And so those are available at Digital Commons at Montana Tech if you want to have a look at those and we'll work on publishing them uh, as we go. And uh, with that, I was uh, ready to answer any questions uh, that people might have um, about uh, our data or uh, what we do. This here is just a crown graph that is 100% um, of the metagenomic data plotted out in a, a circular fashion from the KOA. So I'll take any questions that people have. That's, that's great. We have about five minutes for questions, so thank you. <laughs> Nathan? Hi, this is Nathan Cook from Fish, Wildlife and Parks. Hello. Um, speaking as a person who until today or when I saw this agenda, I'd never heard of a metagenome before. Sure. Can you talk just for a minute what what sort of things you might be able to learn with, with those okay. kind of data and what kind of changes you might see upstream to downstream or over time or yeah, stuff yeah, like that? 
Um, yeah, so a metagenome is, uh, so genomes are when you, you know, you have an organism and it's isolated and you get its genome. And then a metagenome is you go to an environmental location, you know, take a scoop of dirt or a scoop of sediment or filter a bunch of water. And a metagenome is uh, you extract the DNA from that and then you analyze all of the DNA, uh, you sequence all of the DNA that you can in there. And so metagenomic data, um, you can look for particular genes in your data, you can look for particular organisms uh, in your data, and I think of metagenomic data as metabolic potential. So um, you can, uh, if you're interested in arsenic and you want to look up arsenic arsenate transporters, you can see if you find different hits for arsenic arsenate, you know, arsenate arsenite transporters in um, those sorts of data. And so we would expect to see seasonal changes. We would expect to see changes upstream and downstream, you know, with different inputs. Um, and so those are some of the changes, you know, that we'll expect to see. So we'll get way deeper into the data than just like, oh, okay, these are the organisms that are there. We're interested in the potential, what those organisms are actually doing. Um, so you can look at metadata in a, or metagenomic data in a broad brush sense, um, or you can take the data and look for very focused questions, like I'm looking for metal transporters, or I'm looking um, for a particular metabolic process. Yes. So if I can um, make a follow up question, you showed that slide early on with that increased specific conductivity below the pit water discharge. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you would think would influence? Yeah, um, so I need to get somebody excited about extracting those samples, right? So um, yeah, so the next thing is I wanna see how the organisms are changing like across that transition. And then we can see if the input of all that water is affecting um, the changes there. So yes, that is the next thing to do is to get a student that wants to extract DNA across that <laughs> across that transition, yeah. Thank you, thank you for answering those questions. I, the increase in conductivity below the, the discharge is something it's one of the more dramatic changes in water quality mm -hmm. that we've seen in the basin in the last few years. And I'm really curious to what what that means to the biota in, in Silver Bowl yeah. Creek and farther I, downstream. So I'm, I'm really interested. Too. So if anyone has any students that wants to do that, send them my way because I need somebody that wants to do that. <laughs> So Alicia, Rod, Greg, and I were talking, and it would be interesting to get together with some of the work that the USGS is doing on the um, Clark Fork. So maybe we can talk yes. after this at some point and yep. uh, discuss potential collaboration in the near yep. future. That would be that would be great. Yeah. So we have a lot of samples, and you know we haven't done the biological work on a lot of the samples. And um, yeah, Nathan brought up yeah the next thing for us to look at is we want to go across that transition, um, see what's going on with the microbes across that transition for sure. Great. It looks like Travis has a question as well. Okay. Um, more of just I wanted to let you know that um, so I think some of the some of the the unknowns are like how, how are these organisms going to respond to various gradients in the environment like there's natural change in microbial communities longitudinally in a river system due to processes completely independent of reclamation and mine concentration so yes um, we extracted 16s out of every single replicate of four years worth of trace metal experimentation in our musicosm experiments um, had um, Michigan State University do that, and I have all of that data sitting on a hard drive. So if you had a student that was interested in those kind of questions, okay, yeah, data so I, is available, and it's it's just a matter of finding someone with the interest in. Okay, yeah, I have that issue too because um, our we have the masters in geochemistry, so I get a lot of geologists and chemists, right? And then the PhD in earth science and engineering. So like I've only had a couple of biologists, you know, so far really. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks Alicia, that was great. Thank you. All right. All right, next we have Rob, Rob Thomas, are you going to give it a shot? You're going to go for it? Yep. Can you okay. hear me? 
We can hear you. Okay, I think it's coming. I'm loading it up right now. Okay, I'm going to read your uh, your bio. So Rob yeah. Thomas is a Regents Professor of Geology at the University of Montana Western in Dillon. He received the Carnegie Case U.S. Professor of the Year Award in 2009 and is a fellow of the Geological Society of America. He teaches mountain environments to Sherpa mountain guides at the Kumbu Climbing Center near Mount Everest in Nepal, natural hazards at St. George's University in Granada, and domestic geotrips for Yellowstone forever. He has authored or co-authored over 75 publications, including the second editions of the Roadside Geology of Yellowstone Country and the Roadside Geology of Montana which was recently awarded the 2021 High Plains Book Award. And I know what I'm getting people for Christmas now. So thanks, Rob. <laughs> um, You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'll make a dollar fifty on each one. <laughs> <laughs> Is that showing? Yep. OK. You have it full screen, more or less? Melissa? Sir, you are good to go. OK, very good. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm going to present today on work that uh, I've been doing with my uh, undergraduate environmental field studies on uh, phase three, which is uh, currently uh, going through uh, the remediation process. Um, but we've been working on uh, that phase for the last three years. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about how we um, do this work. So um, if I can get this to work, there we go. Um, we've been on uh, again, phase three of the Upper Clark Fork. And uh, the original purpose of the work, uh, like uh, many of you know, uh, Alex uh, Leon uh, is a force of nature, and he drew me into the upper Clark Fork system. I had been working on the fluvial Arctic grayling problem in the upper Big Hole River and, uh, and on Poindexter Slough, which was a um, complete restoration project down here near, near Dillon. Um, so we made the trek up to uh, the upper Clark Fork uh, on a daily basis to do a baseline study of phase three A and B, um, which just east of uh, Galen, and uh, with the hope that we could provide data that would be helpful in uh, the uh, remedia uh, uh, in the design of the remediation. Uh, so um, this will work. There we go. Um, as you all know, Clark Fork is a sinuous single channel low grading meandering stream, and it's actively ranched on phase three. Uh, we you know, would uh, love to see a, uh, a clean stream and, and would love to see uh, those 1908 floodplain uh, deposits not only removed, but the morphology of the channel improved over time. Um, the Slickens, of course, uh, this group understands are dead zones on the floodplain. And when we first came in uh, in 2019, there had been ruptures to dams that had been put in by ARCO in the 1980s to sequester uh, the metals uh, on the slickens. And you, know, you can see here um, discharge breaches uh, on the uh, uh, on the slicken uh, here in phase three uh, with uh, cow pies that have uh, backed up behind <laughs> the breach. And uh, these were happening with uh, uh, thunderstorms that were happening uh, during uh, the uh, summer months and, and even into the fall. So we were interested. It had caused a fish kill, but we really didn't understand uh, how it was affecting the macro invertebrates. Um, and so uh, we not only did this baseline study, but I put my students on uh, taking a look also at these discharges and how they were affecting macroinvertebrates and what the geochemistry looked like in these discharge areas. So the group's uh, typical class size might range from say a low in a, in a bad year to 11 students to as many as 20 in a good. 
uh, year. These are all undergraduate students. That's all we do at Western um, is undergraduate education. Uh, so my group this particular year, I think, was running probably about uh, average, about 15 students. Um, and I broke them into teams and the stream morphology team did 24 cross sections uh, in 3A and 3B. Um, these were uh, cross sections that had been surveyed for the most part um, in 2014. So we were, it allowed us to do some uh, comparison and you can see that there was very minimal change um, from uh, 2014 shown in blue and uh, 20. 19 shown in red. So these cross sections that they were making with uh, survey equipment um, illustrated really not a lot of uh, channel morphology change on phase three A and B, uh, which I suspect was good news. Uh, we did B high analyses. These are bank erosion uh, hazard index calculations. And uh, we found that there was a high susceptibility of the banks to erosion in phase three. Part of that was because there's a lot of bare ground. The bank vegetation survey that we conducted showed 25% bare ground through the two phases. Uh, width depth ratios were average and the sediment size uh, in the stream was running uh, at a pebble gravel um, as the dominant um, size, which is great. Um, not a tremendous amount of siltation, although there were some interesting uh, trends that I'll show you here in a bit. OK, so then I have a team of, uh, that works on in-stream macroinvertebrates. I think this year it was three people, and they sampled three these three slickens that, uh, and two control sites, which were in phase uh, two and phase five. So these were areas that had been remediated. And then they looked at unremediated areas where there had been blowouts on uh, the slickens uh, during these thunderstorm events. Uh, we use a server sampler and we follow the fish, wildlife, and uh, parks protocols. Um, we identify specimens to the familial level and we count them. And then we do some statistical analyses on them, looking at Simpson's and Margalev's uh, index calculations, just to look at diversity and then the richness that exists within uh, that diversity, which is what Mark Lefts does. Um, so that the diversity is not 90% of one family, um, but is instead spread uh, across multiple families. Um, what they found was, if you look at this map, uh, you can't maybe read that, I'll just point out, site one here is upstream of the discharge. So north is, uh, is going downstream, of course, and it, broke through right here and it discharged right here. And so site one is above the discharge point and you can see total of 116 bugs can, uh, collected and uh, uh, the, um, uh, the diversity numbers uh, were good. As you go around the horn and you get to the point of discharge right here, uh, site three and site four, you can see that the uh, total specimens 76 and then dropping to 28 uh, here downstream from the discharge point uh, for the macroinvertebrates and again diversity uh, low. And you can see it in these graphs over here on the right. Um, this top one here is uh, a control site in phase two. So this is a remediated area showing a nice diversity. Simpson's index is uh, a, a good score is one. So 0.78 is a good score. Um, Margulaves, so we want to have high numbers on that. 2.63, that's a good number. If you look down here, this is at a discharge point on a slicken in phase three, just below it. And you can see total specimens 22 versus total specimens of 139 in the control site. And the Simpson similarity index is half of one, um, roughly. And uh, Margulies uh, richness index also low. So there's a correlation between discharge and uh, macroinvertebrate number declines and diversity declines. All right, we also have a sediment mapping team. The sediment mappers go out and they use a gravelometer and they make a map of the sediment using GPS points on the gra on the stream bottom. So in this map that you're looking at, uh, the pebbles and the gravel uh, are shown in blue. 
uh, vegetative, uh, vegetated cobble gravel is shown in green. And what's really important is the yellow. The yellow is the fine grain sediment. That's what discharges off of the floodplain slickens. And so uh, you can see in this uh, map, there's a discharge channel right here in red. You can see that's exposing the 1908 flood deposits. It discharged into the stream right here, and you can see a little narrow bit of fine grain sediment hugging the bank down, going downstream. That is all discharge sediment right there um, from this one event, which was a thunderstorm, late season thunderstorm in 2019. Um, one of the other, uh, uh, so they, we know where the discharge sediments are um, uh, from these events, which is good news to know that. Uh, the other thing that we found was that going from the control site on phase two, going downstream, you can see a trend in yellow here. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And by the time you're in phase five, which is near the Clark Fork Coalition House, um, you can see that the fines have increased quite a bit. Um, this might reflect uh, sedimentation off of the slickens in phases three and four. And these are just pictures of what the bottom, the substrate looks like. Typically, again, cobbles and pebbles and cobbles, uh, and then these fine grain sediments here are uh, uh, less common, only 15%, but increasing downstream again, possibly because of the exposure of the slickens. All right, we do geochemistry uh, as well. So we collected samples at those discharge areas as well as above those discharge areas. And uh, again, what one of the things that we saw was that uh, uh, metal concentrations were highest below the slicken discharge sites. Um, and uh, that correlates with low macroinvertebrate numbers. Um, the data that we gather and analyze initially, we did that through the uh, generosity of Chris Gammons at Montana Tech, who uh, let us, he helped us uh, through the work uh, at the lab at Montana Tech using the XRF gun. Uh, the following year, I had money from Cruz and uh, we sent samples off to uh, uh, um, Energy Labs in Helena. Uh, where they were um, uh, analyzed with the ICPMS, and we got similar numbers that we got in 2019 uh, in uh, our later uh, geochemical studies. Um, so uh, that was good to see. Uh, some of the things just generally we see uh, is that at these discharge points, like here on Slicken 1, very high numbers, of things like sulfur, iron. Uh, we had incredibly high numbers of arsenic. Uh, um, and uh, most of the metals are just really high at these discharge points, which again is uh, to be expected. They are coming off the slickens. All right, so without going through all the details of these, um, the students have to put all this together and then come up with recommendations. And then uh, for their final in this particular class, they present their recommendations to the agencies who are involved. And uh, those folks uh, um, provide the students with feedback and uh, comments, and the students have to answer those questions. And uh, our hope is, is that the data are used. My top priority is educating my students. Uh, my secondary priority is having the data they collect be of value to folks um, at the agencies. So um, generally what we've found is that uh, um, the, you know, slickens uh, on phase three were a problem and uh, they uh, probably were affecting bugs as well as fish. And so uh, there was, I'm not saying that our group it was responsible for it, but it was good to see that uh, uh, temporary barriers were put up on the slickens to try to prevent discharge off the slickens into uh, the Clark Fork. Uh, that happened, uh, I think, in 2020. And uh, I understand that a lot of those were hay bales that got eaten by uh, Hans Lambert's uh, cows, <laughs> but uh, it was good that it was done. Um, and uh, uh, 
One of the other things that we have suggested is that um, where you had mature willows along the banks that in order to preserve that habitat of overhanging willow in particular for fish, that those be left uh, alone and that uh, maybe those are not areas that we should disturb and leave a little metal. Uh, the uh, willows are in the, in the uh, water birch are, are uh, adapted to it and uh, seem to do just fine. And uh, that's habitat that we could leave preserved. And they are doing that on phase 3A and B remediation right now. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite pleased about that. Um, it was that was good news again uh, related to our work. Uh, I don't know how much it drove it, but it it uh, it was a recommendation from the students. Uh, this year we were out uh, for a week and we did phase one and two uh, beehive mapping. Uh, Karen Boyd had done beehive mapping there in 2009, and so we did it again in 2021 to see how it had changed. And the take home is, is that the very high and extreme uh, erodibility of banks have gone away uh, uh, at the expense of high and moderate um, stream bank erosion. The 2009 is on the left, 2021 is on the right. Um, and so overall, there's been a decrease in extreme uh, in these phases and a, a uh, in 2021 and a uh, increase in high and moderate. So the these treatments with the core logs have definitely stabilized the banks. Um, they have some other problems associated with them uh, in terms of just stream morphology developing over time. It slows that down a bit, uh, but they have definitely stabilized the banks. And lastly, how do the undergraduates do this? If you don't already know, Western is the first and only public university in the history of the United States to have students taking one class at a time. Uh, they take one class for 18 days uh, and uh, I put them out on projects. So in short, uh, we're for hire. Um, I, I tell the students this is a job and I'm the boss and uh, we're the uh, you know, environmental sciences department uh, um, consulting firm and, and we're available for hire and we're cheap. Uh, and the good news for my students is uh, uh, they get a um, CV that's filled with uh, examples of what they can do and it has helped them with their job placement. We're getting about a great, a little bit higher than 90% job placement in the discipline within a year of graduation. And with that, I will answer questions. Nice, we have a couple minutes for questions. It must be my clarity. <laughs> ben. Yeah, uh, really enjoyable talk. Need to see that in a formal context. I've seen bits and pieces th of this over time. Yeah. My question for you is in terms of the fine sediment, what, yeah. remind me what year those data are from? Uh, we did that, Ben, in 2019, and then we repeated again in 2020. Okay, okay, interesting. Yeah, no, it's just uh, we've made some informal observations downstream uh, in terms of fine sediments this year in particular that seemed quite a bit more uh, noticeable, but yeah. you know, it's informal. We don't have numbers. We just yep. have perceptions. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had to shorten my duration because of COVID this year. I just couldn't have the students in the vans, you know, going up there. I had larger numbers. So we did a week up there and did this beehive study and we didn't repeat the mapping and 3A and B were being, you know, going through the remediation process, but uh, we'll be game to be back out there next year and do more sediment mapping. So outstanding. Uh, well, thanks uh, so much, Rob. Really enjoyed yeah, it. You bet, Ben. I'm open to suggestions. So what we want to do what people want done. <laughs> so let us let me know. Anything else? I think our, your time is up. OK, that's I'm good at that. Yeah, <laughs> great. Thank you so much. Thank you.
All right. Um, our, let's see, Erica. When you're while you're loading, I will read your bio. OK, so. Let's see, you want to stop sharing. Rob. OK, so our next speaker is Dr. Erica Krutoff. Hopefully I said that right. Um, and she is an associate professor of the environmental sustainability at the University of Montana Western, where she has been working with the undergraduate students to examine public use and public perceptions of the Warm Springs ponds to help inform future management decisions. Thanks so much. Hi, Erica. Thanks. Hello. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. I am excited to present on our survey results for those who we're at the last presentation of the survey results there. It's going to look very similar, but um, hopefully this is reaching um, some new folks as well. So moving upstream to the Warm Springs ponds, um, which fulfill an important job settling heavy metals from Silver, Silver Bow Creek before it enters the Clark Fork River. And because it's good at its job there, it's been estimated that there's approximately 19 million cubic yards of contaminated waste um, sediment in these ponds, which poses environmental and human health risks. Uh, the Warm Springs ponds are also uh, managed by Fish Wildlife Parks and run as a management um, wildlife area, and it attracts a lot of people who come here to recreate. And so we know it, these ponds get a lot of recreational use. And so this research really seeks to fill the knowledge gap about public use and public perceptions of the Warm Springs ponds. And again, kind of what Rob said, ideally this, this information gets used and um, moves forward in terms of decision making for this, for this region. So similar to Rob's project, um, this is also what's cruise funded and really working with students and getting students engaged in, in research. Uh, we are an undergraduate institution and so the students don't have the same opportunities and exposure and so that's something our department really works to make sure our students get while they're here and the goal is to make this collaborative research and kind of co-design the survey so we reached out to major stakeholders organizations agencies working in and specifically around the warm springs ponds so arco montana fish wildlife parks Natural Resource Damage Program, Clark Fork Coalition, and US EPA. And we did interviews with these um, stakeholders and to really clarify the need. And then we kind of went back and forth with our survey to make sure we're asking questions and getting the data that they can use. So the survey was um, out for several months and we had a we created a website to put it out on and then Students put posters around town, and then we tried to flood a bunch of different listservs for people who we thought would be interested in taking the survey. And our goal was to get 300 respondents. We ended up getting 348, although only 306 made it to the end. <laughs> um, and it was a long survey, so I do feel like that shows that the people who responded to the survey were invested in, in the questions we were asking. You had to be over 18 to take the survey. Ages ranged from 21 to 82 with a median age of 56. So the results I'm going to share today are almost all just from the survey, really looking at who's using the ponds, what are people's prior knowledge about the ponds, how are they being used, what do people love, what are they concerned about, and what are some of their suggestions. So of the survey, Almost everyone was from Montana, so 97% of people who took the survey um, were from Montana, and 75% of those who took this survey were from kind of local communities, View, Anaconda, Deer Lodge, Missoula. Um, so something I just want to point out, so the students did also did student, um, sorry, participant observations where they go out to the ponds and observe people and see how are people using the ponds to supplement the survey data. Um, this is the only slide that I'm sharing data about those observations. 
And I just want to highlight here that our survey only selected the people, the results I'm showing are from the people who took the survey, and that does not capture everyone who's using the ponds. So what the students saw was that about 50% of the license plates at the Warm Springs ponds were from out of state. So they are getting a lot of out of state use. And while some of those people are just stopping by, um, the, the students talked to some of the people and said they come year after year. This is, you know, their summer annual trip. They always make a point to stop at the ponds. So they're there are a lot of out of state voices who we don't capture in this survey. So it was kind of split about 50 50 um, people who come to the ponds zero to five times a year versus um, five to lots of times per year. Uh, with most people staying between one to three hours, but a range. And, and asking if people knew where the ponds were. Almost everyone, 97% who took our survey, were familiar with the ponds. 90% of the people had visited the ponds, and only 10% who took the survey had not visited. And when we asked why they hadn't visited, largely they fell into these categories, just didn't know about the ponds, busy traveling somewhere else, um, just felt the need, never felt the need to stop, and some people were actively avoiding um, the site. So before getting the survey, we were curious if people knew that the ponds were owned, maintained, and operated by ARCO. And what we found was that most people, 74%, were aware of this. Only 26% did not know. And then we also asked before getting the survey, did you know that Montana Fish Wildlife Parks runs a designated wildlife management area here? And a lot more people knew. So 92% of the people who took the survey knew that was the case. It is on the maps and on the signage there. Uh, only 8% didn't know. Before getting the survey, um, you know, what what best describes your knowledge of the Warm Springs ponds? Did people know that they were acting as a settling basin to reduce heavy metal contamination? And um, what we found was a lot of people had, had knowledge of that. 83% had somewhat or very felt very knowledgeable, while only 17% had little or no knowledge. Again, before getting the survey, because the survey had some background information about the ponds, um, how concerned were, were you about the human health effects of heavy metal contamination in the Warm Springs ponds? And what we found was, you know, 67% had little or very concerned, while 33% little to no concern. Do people know they're not supposed to swim at the ponds? 73% knew, but there was 27% who were unaware. And that fishing is limited to catch and release only at the ponds. 82% knew this, 18% were unaware. We also wanted to get just kind of general impression of the ponds. Um, so 82% were favorable or very favorable. And some of those, a lot of those reasons um, people could choose more than one for the wildlife, the scenery, the habitat, the peaceful setting, uh, fishing, the trails, hunting, and, and the reclamation of the ponds. Some people talked about what those ponds looked like when they were children and how much it's changed for the better. Uh, 11% unfavorable or very unfavorable and largely around water quality and treatment too many risks, lack of maintenance, cleanliness, um, and that some people were complaining the fishing could be better. We were curious where people's information was coming from, and we, again, people could choose multiple. So kind of a wide range here, but some people from just visiting the ponds, there's a lot of signage at the ponds. There's been a bunch of public meetings, news sources, word of mouth, school university, online. And then the other, we had people fill out and we found most people who selected others because they work at the ponds or um, maybe teach at the ponds or, or out there for kind of work related. So people are out using the ponds, lots of different activities, and we kind of were trying to look at some of the activities by season. The winter is when it has the least amount of usage. Summer is the greatest, but, um, you know, but some, 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 trends and variations by season there. 
but largely coming just to relax, walk around, drive. Some people just come there to drive around, um, watching wildlife, hiking, fishing, and um, dog swimming, hunting, and, and then these are just kind of the top ones, but everything from kite skiing to, um, there was a, a, someone training their, their huskies for dog sledding. So we, we tell them in part of the survey to date, limited studies have been conducted on bioaccumulation of metals in waterfowl. How concerned are you about the potential for heavy metal accumulation in wildlife? And we saw quite, quite a concern. 83% very or a little bit concerned. 17% not very or no concern. And then similarly, that same question, but how, how concerned are you about consuming meat from ducks? that visit the Warm Springs Pond. Um, and this saw less concern um, here, and which is kind of interesting. And then this made me wonder, sometimes you wonder how these questions are interpreted. Am I concerned about eating, um, about bioaccumulation from, from consuming meat at the ponds? I personally am not because I don't partake in that. So, um, so it raises some questions here of just why this big difference between these two, when one's for human health and one's wildlife, but um, so it kind of raises more questions. These are the questions I personally cannot stand when I am taking a survey. Are you happy with the warmth response? Yes or no? Well, it's so much more complicated than that, and it depends. But part of the survey design is to force people to pick one or the other and to kind of put themselves in these two different categories. And what we found was when forced into these two categories, 59% are happy with the ponds. A um, couple quotes, we love the area and its public access to the recreational activities that are presently there and we appreciate any additions to the great spot. And then another comment was, yes, I believe my wife and I would be the first to lay down in front of bulldozers if it came to that in the future. Um, Part of this question, are you happy with the warm spring ponds? 41% said they're unhappy with the ponds. And just two quotes from there. The questions in this survey are surprising. You make it sound like a recreation area when it is a place to be avoided. To me, it seems a big embarrassment that a wildlife reserve is there now. I didn't know all the scientific data when I lived there. These findings are not publicized much. Um, and asking about suggestions, we got wide range of things. Again, these are kind of the top ones and people could choose multiple, but working to clean up contamination. People are interested in having wanting to be able to eat the fish and, and recreate there without that concern. Um, there was concern for downstream risks for both people and um, wildlife and fish and keep working on habitat wildlife protection. Some people are talked about better access, more roads, um, boat ramps beach swimming area, um, better vegetation management, maintenance of the grounds. Some people were complaining about you know, little things about the bird poop or things like that. And then um, better fishing and wanting, wanting um, ground trout. So across the board, we have these kind of across the spectrum of interest. Largely what we saw are people really enjoy using the ponds across the boat. Across, well, sorry, across the board. However, there was a strong group, whether even though it was a bit smaller, a very vocal group that was raising some major concerns about the water quality contamination and, and the risk associated with that. And oh, another big takeaway was nice one to see was just that people are really interested to learn more. So 75% of the respondents chose at least one, if not multiple of these, wanting to know more about the history wanting to know more about what's happening today in the current state of the ponds, what's going on in the future, and um, some of the science and the ponds functioning at the settling basin and how they can be involved. So with that, I will take any questions. That's great. We have a good five minutes for questions. Good talk. Hey Erica, this is Melissa. This is um, this is kind of fascinating. 
people's perception, you know, and I would never have thought to, to do this. Are you doing other um, surveys on other areas in Montana or is this your pilot? This was the pilot and um, that said it's generated some interest. It sounds like there's some interest in looking at even just Silver, Silver Bow Creek, Upper Clark Fork. So there's room to expand. I do want to be careful we don't overwhelm all the same people again. <laughs> but um, but yeah, no, this was kind of a pilot and, and I didn't have a chance to talk too much about this, but this really was a student project and this is the first time I'm kind of the only one presenting on it. But and part of that was just timing. But the students got to learn research design. They learned how to design the survey, and then they were the ones doing all the data collection and working on the analysis too. So, um, but now, now they're well trained, and now um, some of the classes are kind of designed around that too. So we could definitely do more. So are you going to take the next step, and then have the students potentially publish their results, or? Um... Yeah, that would be great. Um, right now, the next, the, the shorter range future is uh, working more on dissemination and, and kind of doing a doing a finer comb through the data and, and really connecting, making sure all the information we have is getting to those stakeholders that the questions they were really interested in, make sure we get them all those detailed data. Um, with 300 respondents, we had a lot of open ended questions, so there's just a lot of a lot of things in there. Um, but yeah, down the road, it would be great to publish and get the students involved in that as well. Eric has a question as well. Hi, Erica. Thanks. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, I, I suspect you have noticed this, um, but I was just spent some time up at uh, Warm Springs a while ago, and I was really kind of shocked to see posters up in some of these information areas, for example, you know, birds of the area, but they were posters of like birds of the world or birds like they were showing blue jays and secretary birds that occur in Africa. And I mean, it, the information on some of those sites was um, really had nothing. It was I felt misleading and had nothing to do with the biology or the history of the spot. So uh, that would be one obvious spot to address some of these things that came up in your surveys. And I, I don't know who controls those, but um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, this is a little kind of going back to just some of the data is that a lot of people felt they were very knowledgeable coming into the survey. And yet in the response is what we saw, I think was a lot of mis misunderstanding ab about the area and about how it functions and, and why it's there and what and what the issues are. And so there is a, there's definitely a need for education around it seems like the ponds and what's going on and then also the wildlife. So I, yeah, I'm, I'm, that could that could definitely be a student project down the road and probably teaming up with fish wildlife parks parks would be my guess on that one. But um, thanks for pointing that out. And yeah, I think there's a lot of room to work on education at the ponds. Have you presented these? results to FWP in terms of education? Yep, so we did a public presentation to that, that group of stakeholders and um, and then we're going to be working on in the next class working on kind of little write ups that are specific to each each of those different organization agencies. Any other questions for Erica? That was, that was great, Erica. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. All right, last but definitely not least, we have Vicki Watson and we'll just jump into it since she is our last presenter of the day. And I'll read your, Vicki, while you're loading up your presentation, I will read your bio. So Vicki grew up on a small family farm in Texas in the Trinity River watershed and she attended college in Houston and that was part of the San Jacinto River watershed and she was a grad student in Wisconsin as part of the Yahara River watershed. So almost 40 years ago she moved to Montana's Clark Fork watershed to teach research at U of M 
And all of these watersheds have been great places to live and deserve the loving care of their citizens. And you did it, Vicki, fantastic. Oh. <laughs> okay, great. yes, what a surprise. I'm, I hope you, can, you can all see my uh, presentation at this point. Um, and I, I want to say today's talks have just been fantastically informative. And I'm going to shift downstream a little bit and talk about how studies like the ones reported on today are being used to develop um, watershed restoration plans. And the reason this uh, slide says thanks for helping create a watershed restoration plan for the heart of the Clark Fork is because I, I've also used it in some meetings we had uh, working on this, but also because a lot of today's speakers have provided information that has been used in developing watershed restoration plans, both for the upper river, but also for the central Clark Fork. And this was an effort initially of the Clark Fork and Kootenai River Basin Council which was created by the Montana legislature to work on the state water plan. But after that was done, the council wanted to continue working uh, to help with restoration projects in the Clark Fork. But then COVID came along and the council has become uh, rather dormant at present. Uh, but, we're, but some of us are still trying to move this forward. And some of the entities, these are some of the entities that have contributed information and ideas, uh, have been uh, helping out in a number of ways, but there, there are others. And uh, what ha happened was as we were looking for things to work on in 2018, we heard that now you had to have an approved watershed restoration plan to, for, to apply for many kinds of funding, including the 319 non-point source funding. So I uh, went on the DEQ website and looked to see uh, what parts of the Clark Fork Basin already had uh, approved watershed restoration plans and what did not. And at that time found that almost all of the Clark Fork Basin with just the uh, exception of like wilderness areas and, and the tribal lands already had uh, approved watershed plans. But what did not was the center or the heart of the Clark Fork from the confluence with Flint Creek to the confluence with the Flathead River. I was absolutely shocked. You know, what, what have we been doing that we haven't uh, gotten a watershed restoration plan done when everybody else in the basin already has? So we started to work on that. It was sort of my uh, retirement project and I hired some students to help me and uh, then Soon afterwards, the DEQ website showed that we were now working on a, uh, a watershed restoration plan. I think this uh, is from 2019. And I just looked to see what, the, uh, what they have online now. And a few more sites since 2019 now uh, are working on watershed restoration plans, but not a lot has happened since then. And I'm sure COVID has something to do with that. So this is the Central Clark Fork, again, from the confluence with um, Flint Creek to the confluence with the, the Flathead River. And these are some of the streams that earlier were identified in TMDLs as being impaired by pollutants. And so they have TMDLs, but there are more uh, streams of problems besides these. And of course, the main stem itself is also impaired. So we started developing this watershed restoration plan by gathering and summarizing relevant documents on the basin, the TMDLs, restoration projects that were ongoing, monitoring results. And we hosted a first stakeholder meeting in November of 2018. And this was aimed at the technical folks, the, you know, the people working for the Forest Service and uh, fish, uh, fish, Wildlife and Parks and various others. And we also constructed a website that the Clark Fork Coalition hosts to display the information that we were gathering. And also we put a, a survey online there for citizens to um, answer questions about their concerns. We hosted a series of meetings for interested citizens in April, May, and August of 2019. Uh, that website um, provides summaries of some key documents. This is what those students that I hired did. They would take thousand page documents and boil them down to 10 essential pages of information. 
so we were relying on uh, all these sources of information here, various TMDLs and uh, um, the status of the closed pulp mill on the river near Frenchtown. That's a super fun site. Oops. And uh, from that first meeting with the uh, technical folks, we learned that a lot of restoration work was already going on in the Clark Fork, funded in other ways. Uh, since 2000, uh, Fish Wildlife Parks, Trout Unlimited, and the Forest Service have been working together and have carried out over 70 restoration projects involving 30 creeks in the basin. Missoula City and County have been doing riparian restoration projects in parks and improving their stormwater runoff have a lot more plans. Conservation District has provided funds for channel migration zone mapping, fish passage improvement, and preparing for dam removal on Rattlesnake Creek. So a lot had already been done, but a lot more needed to be done and more funding was needed. Uh, so again, those uh, technical participants provided us with the sort of information you find in TMDLs, and again, information on their completed projects and their high priority next projects. And uh, we combined all of this information into a list. This is only a partial list of the creeks. It's just a few to illustrate what we had on this list, which county they were in, and um, whether they were pollutant impaired and had a TMDL, so those have got a 4A beside them, or whether they are impaired but not by pollutants, so they don't have a TMDL necessarily. And uh, were they a priority stream as far as fish, wildlife, and parks, Trout Unlimited, and the Forest Service were concerned? Were they a identified as a priority by Missoula City and County, and also as a priority by the Conservation District? So again, this is an incomplete list, just showing you how we were uh, summarizing information about them. We collected surveys at uh, online and at meetings and tabling from March 2018 to, excuse me, November 2018 to March 2019 from over 100 people, 65 different groups of various kinds represented, everything from government agencies, nonprofits, businesses, uh, and more. And we learned from those later stakeholder meetings that the citizens um, agreed with the watershed professional about what a lot of the priority uh, systems are, but they wanted to add O'Keefe Creek, which is near the closed pulp mill, and uh, these several other creeks that they were familiar with and thought should be priorities. And, but that came, we came up with a list of over 30 creeks plus the main stem, and we asked people to vote. They had two votes for their top priorities, and the Clark Fork main stem won the top, and then the additional creeks that went into this top group were Flat Creek, Trout Creek, Fish Creek, Petty Creek, Albert Creek, and Grant Creek. We sent that list to the watershed professionals and they said, that's a nice list, but please add the Rattlesnake Creek, Cedar Mill, and Deer Creeks. We consider them priorities. So now we had you know, 10 creeks plus the main stem. What goes into a watershed restoration plan is it should identify the health goals that have been identified by stakeholders, sources of impairments, future threats, list all the impaired water bodies and how what load reductions are thought to be necessary there, describe non-point source management actions that are needed. And all this sort of information uh, generally can be found in TMDLs and restoration studies, the health goals we gathered from these uh, citizen meetings. The rest of the WRP should estimate the technical and financial assistance needed for actions, describe an education and outreach plan for the public, present a schedule for implementing the management actions, list the milestones you're gonna to use to gauge your progr progress, specify criteria to assess effectiveness, and describe monitoring plans to evaluate improvements over time. Well, of course, this is a big area and we're talking about a lot of streams. So this would be, once again, one of those thousand page documents unless we got creative about how to try to keep this shorter. Our goal was to keep it fairly short and focused, make it about a 20 to 30 page document with multiple appendices on the priority creeks. We would try as much as possible to cover all the common themes in this introductory document and then get into greater detail on each priority creek in those appendices. 
Again, uh, we talked about causes and sources of impairment. They were very common across the basin. Uh, the causes were common and the sources were similar across the basin for the most part. Well, what happened to this effort that was percolating along so rapidly there for a year or two? We, put a, we gave a draft to the DEQ and uh, they came back with, well, this looks great, but we need more detailed cost estimates on the specific individual projects. And of course, that uh, is pretty tough to put together, especially as the COVID pandemic came along right about then and slowed everything down. Just a lot harder to get that kind of information out of um, uh, the various groups working on restoration projects. Another thing that happened uh, early this year was our legislature repealed Montana's numeric nutrient standards and created a nutrient working group to develop a new approach to addressing nutrient pollution based on narrative standards. And they are coming out with proposals of how they're going to do that this month. And of course, we were unsure exactly how that was going to impact the Central Clark Watershed Restoration Plan because nutrients were a big part of that. The other thing that happened was a couple of knee injuries to this volunteer WRP writer. In fact, tomorrow I will be in surgery getting uh, some knee repair. And um, I had no idea that writing watershed restoration plans could be so hazardous. Uh, but hopefully uh, I'll be back and able to work on this again soon. The other thing we decided to do is because there's so much going on in Grant Creek right now. This rapid urbanizing fringe of uh, Missoula, a huge agricultural area is about to get completely covered with high density residential and commercial development. So we decided that it was now the top priority and that we would pull Grant Creek out of the, the bigger WRP for its own WRP and focus on getting that done and then focusing on a smaller number of those priority sub watersheds for the Central Clark Fork WRP. Uh, again, this shows that, that Central Clark Fork from Drummond down to the confluence with the um, Flathead. And it shows those streams that are impaired by pollutants in red, streams that are impaired but by non-pollutants like water flow manipulation or things of that sort. Some additional streams that stakeholders wanted to add to this list. And it also shows uh, that this is a, a, a four county area um, and that we've got that the vast majority of the land is public land. And there is also some Weyerhaeuser land. And then you see a little bit of uh, private land and more private land on the upstream end than on the downstream end. So uh, we're hoping by doing this to act to protect our investments we've already made in restoration and conservation. These Estimates I dug up a number of years ago, and they apply to the whole Clark Fork Basin, not just the Central Basin. But we have spent well over a billion dollars already on restoring the, uh, the Clark Fork Basin, and, and some of that has been spent in the Central Basin. And this doesn't even include uh, many, many projects by the NRCS and the US Fish and Wildlife Service and many groups and individuals. So, we spent a lot on the basin. We want to protect those investments and keep moving forward. And this says that a healthier Central Clark Fork is possible, but we won't get it by wishing for it. It'll take a lot of hard work and goodwill on the part of all the watershed citizens, take a lot of education, better management, and a willingness to put some limits on ourselves, especially as our population grows, because we're asking more and more of the basin all the time. But if we do our part, the river watershed will do most of the work of recovery itself. So you are in this beautiful basin. You are some very lucky people. And this is your chance to ask some questions if you have some. Very nice. Thank you. We have, we have plenty of time for questions. People are probably ready to head someplace to a watering hole and uh, cool down for tomorrow. <laughs> There's lots of breweries in the basin, isn't there? Yes. Um, so Vicki, did you want to maybe mention what you had emailed to me about the Clark Fork Basin Citizen? Um, the, the, yeah, the, Clark, the, the, um, 
starting back in 1985, we started a series of Clark Fork symposia every five years. And, and they, uh, of course, in the early years, um, all we had were uh, people's uh, uh, written papers on their presentation. And then later we had PowerPoint presentations. And then later we had actually films of presentations. Uh, they are all archived on a site called ScholarWorks, and it, people continue to look those up. I, I get uh, reports ever so often about how, how many people are accessing that site. And so that we didn't do one in uh, 2020 uh, because people were just, you know, struggling so hard to get their jobs done in light of COVID. Uh, so we said, well, we'll just put it off. Maybe we'll do one in 2021. But then I heard a, of a, the Upper Clark Fork Working Group was doing monthly um, presentations and, and, and uh, recording those and archiving them online. So I provided a, a link from the Scholar Work site to that so that people would know about them. And then I thought it would be good. These have been, I've been so impressed with today's presentations, and I'm going to have to miss tomorrow's presentation. So I thought, well, they're being recorded too, so I would be happy to provide a link from ScholarWorks to wherever today's and tomorrow's presentations are going to be archived online. And I just put those that you sent in the in the chat, so those links are in there. Great. Should I stop sharing? Yep, you can start stop sharing. Thanks, Vicki. Okay, I, I hit stop sharing and then I'm supposed to end the slideshow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ta -da. Yay, you did it. Yay. Well, thank, thank you, everybody. This was amazing. The quality of the presentations is just spectacular. And I am excited to have uh, another day tomorrow to hear more. So we are back. So it's not eight o'clock tomorrow, just so you guys know. 8 30 a.m. tomorrow is when we will start day two. So have a good evening. Thank you so much to all the presenters and for everybody who attended. This has been fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful. Good job, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Great job. <laughs>